All right. Hello, folks. Uh, here we are with the, uh, the inaugural edition of the uh, D.B. Cooper uh, Sleuth, uh, I guess, uh, YouTube and podcast. Uh, hoping that I'll see some uh, familiar faces uh, or read some familiar names in the uh, in the comment section. So really, uh, the idea I had was just, you know, um, I was basically doing the Facebook live stuff and that just doesn't work too well. Um, it's kind of a uh, a finicky process. There's always, hey, can you hear me now? How do I look? Oh, are you sideways? Are you upside down? Are you on the moon? Uh, what are you doing? So this is a lot easier. So um, doing this, and so I'm also going to make this into a, a podcast format. I think uh, whenever I do these, I'll I'll shift it over to, to be a podcast. So really, uh, I wanted my first guest to be uh, one of my BFFs uh, in the uh, Cooper world, and that's uh, Mr. Chris Cunningham. Uh, live from Florida. You're you're near Miami, right? Yeah, Fort Lauderdale area. All right, good deal. Yeah, well, I am in. Pleasure to be here, buddy. I'm I'm uh, I'm super, uh, you know, uh, proud to be the first guest on your hopefully uh, long running, you know, series here, and you know, get lots of good guests. I know you you, you will. So uh, thanks. Yeah, super super proud to to be the be the inaugural one. You, you are the man. So here we go. So let's just jump right in. Also, what I want to say is uh, what I'd like for tonight. We're just going to shoot the shoot the crap. And also uh, anybody. Hi, hi, Wendina. Uh, we're just going to shoot the crap uh, with some people. Um, any Q&A's just, you know, but uh, I guess first uh, what I want to talk about is uh, CooperCon. Uh, just thoughts on the event, criticisms of the event, positives. Uh, what was your what was your takeaway from it this year? You know, the, the, the best thing about CooperCon is the social aspect of it, in my opinion. You know, uh, the DB Cooper community, for the most part, is an Internet community. You know, I mean, we know each other kind of through Facebook and some message boards and maybe, you know, time and again, phone calls and text messages. But, you know, it's not one that gets together regularly and meets in person. So it's always very cool to sit and have some beers with you know, people involved in the Cooper case, uh, researchers, you know, people who principals in the case who were involved. Um, you know, it's always neat. You know, obviously, Larry Carr was there. Uh, Bill Grinnell was there. Uh, Bill Mitchell, of course, was there again. Uh, yeah. You know, lots of people who were actually involved in the case. And those are the people, obviously, that we like to talk about. And the other th cool thing about uh, CooperCon, in addition to the social aspect of it, of, of kind of meeting in person the people that you, you're you're friends with online is you meet so many interesting people that you may not have met otherwise i'll give you a perfect example we were sitting in the cafeteria of the museum of flight and someone brought over uh one of the pursers uh that, that lady i forget her name but she yeah. was a purser Easy. back in 71 and older lady but sharp as a whip and she knew ev she knew everybody on a flight she yeah. she you know talked about the old days nwa and, and and that kind of and just talking to somebody who was there and and you know kind of experienced that event really up close was was very cool so that to me is the best part of CooperCon. um you know in terms of the actual event itself it was great seeing tom you know and and uh, having him give his presentation as always uh, it's outstanding. You know, as yeah. an educator myself, Tom does a, 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 in my opinion, a brilliant job of taking very complicated material like diatoms and, and uh, you know, soil and, you know, all of this sort of stuff and make it very approachable, very digestible. Um, yeah, it's a very complicated topic, but he's able to dumb it down for the rest of us um in a not condescending way so yeah um, credit to him um for that and uh you know so that was great hearing larry carr talk was great um and i got a kick out of seeing bill grinnell because he and i have been communicating quite frequently and you know we've kind of become buds so that was cool um just a super gentleman um yeah. so you know all of that all of that was great um I also was really thrilled to be the moderator for the um, uh, Hiding in Plain Sight uh, panel, uh, which included uh, Arlene uh, and Pat, um, you know, as has been discussed, 
uh, the female voices a lot of times are not heard in the Cooper vortex and certainly haven't been presented, um, in my opinion, satisfactorily at CooperCon. So it was really great to be a part of that and, uh, and allow those voices to be heard and, and hopefully they will be, um, you know, included, you know, in the future and, and uh, we get to hear those different ideas, different perspectives, um, you know, because they're, they're, they're really valuable. So that was kind of a, a, a highlight for me too. What about yeah. you? What is your, well, uh, you kind of, well, I was going to say you kind of buried the lead there that we uh, or didn't, didn't even mention the lead, uh, which is that we had. Uh, I, I did that on purpose, buddy. I'm a pro. I left that for the, you. Set, for set, you. Set, you teed it up. Yes. I mean, we had uh, we had we had the man himself. I mean, we had uh, a skyjacker. You know, Martin McNally was there. Um, I mean, this guy did it. You know, I mean, it is a, a re I mean, it is really I. I it's astonishing when you really, if you really give yourself some perspective on the fact that this guy actually did, this guy was a real life DB Cooper. Mm -hmm. um, and he was there in the flesh and hanging out with us for, for days. I mean, uh, you know, I, I mean, it, it, there he is there uh, being arrested back in 72. But I mean, this guy was there. He did it. He jumped out of a 727. I mean, you know, it, it was incredible. And so for him to actually be there with us, uh, in person uh, was just incredible, you know. And here's a photo with his uh, his stewardess. I mean, this is this is the woman that he hijacked years, you know, years earlier. This is this was his uh, his Tina, basically, uh, was the one that he kept on the plane and and, and talked to her. And they're, and they're buddies now. They talk on the phone and text. I believe he was texting her from CooperCon. Uh, they are just old old enemies, I guess. In a way, it's interesting. It's like the it's like when you see the Japanese and the Americans get together on Iwo Jima or something, it's right. You know, you're just young and stupid, you know, hijacker, you know, but, but, you know, but he, but he was a real treat. And, you know, I, I likened it to like, think about how, you know, we could, uh, I used to, I, I love the civil war, you know, and I will literally never be able to talk to somebody who was at Gettysburg. Like that's mm -hmm. just gone. Mm -hmm. And, you know, hopefully this case isn't still perplexing people 100, 100 years from now, but it probably will be. And, and when it and when it is, uh, they're going to they're going to say, damn, how cool would it have been to hang out with somebody who did this? Right. Yep. And so we got to do that you know, you know, you know, pretty up close and personal for days. Uh, and, you know, it was a real treat to have. I think that, you know, the, my moment that I will take away from CooperCon really was during McNally's, we had McNally up there for two hours talking about uh, the hijacking. And frankly, uh, two hours wasn't enough. No, because not even you, remotely. I mean, you, you guys were running up against time and, uh, you know, you guys could have gone on for like another 30 or 40 minutes easily. Yeah, it was it was upsetting, actually, that we were cut short. I mean, you know, it, it shouldn't have, you know, it there was no need for that to be you know, cut short. I mean, like you said, we could have gone on, you know, forever well, because I, I know told, just so you know, I was told cause I was moderating that day, uh, you know, overseeing the event that day, that third day. And I was told by the powers that be that we have a hard out at four o'clock. So yeah. And that makes sense. The audio video guys had to go home. You know, it was that sort of thing, you know, it, it was, that, it was that sort of a, uh, you know, thing where, you know, the people had to, you know, there were employees there who needed to, who needed to, to, uh, you know, get gone in a way, I guess, right. and get home and have their, you know, well, you know I, I get all that. McNally served really two purposes in my mind at CooperCon. One was he's obviously a very close analog to, to D.B. Cooper, mm -hmm. um, you know, so picking his mind and what he did and his thought process um, gives us some insight into Cooper. So that's very yes. valuable. Um, and then just the idea of hang, like I told my son, my 19 year old son, uh, attended CooperCon with me. And, uh, you know, he, you know, being 19, he was like, ah, you know, I'm like, man, how many times in your life are you going to be able to say you get to hang out with a real life American pirate? You know, I, I legit, like, yeah. like literally, like it's, this is going to be a cool experience. And it's not just, you see them on stage. I mean, you know, we hung out, had dinner with him. I sat in the same yes. booth with him. You know, yeah. had, uh, you know, bought beers for him, you know, clinked glasses together. So, you know, and his memory great. is great. Yeah. And, and it's and everybody there is approachable. There's nobody that's untouchable. There's nobody there who's, 
you know, larger than life. And, you know, it's, it's not like a, you know, right. maybe there's Taylor Swift and Travis Kelsey, man. It's everybody. Oh, God, super, no. super cool. And, and Martin was one of those, you know, guys and, you know, Marty, I consider Marty a buddy. So. Yes, exactly. I mean, yeah. I, I really, it's, it's weird to think about that, that like he is a legitimate, uh, a, right. a friend at this point, I would say, you know, right. for both of us. Right. You right. know, and, and, you know, my, you know, my big takeaway, you know, um, you know, my, my, you know, my big takeaway, I guess the moment that for me was um, the coolest thing was that when I was interviewing McNally on stage, you know, there was a moment there where, you know, I, I was watching, I really wanted to see how Bill Mitchell um you know, was going to interact with him um, because here's a guy who was a victim, mm -hmm. a very notable victim of, a, of mm -hmm. one of these things. Right. Mm -hmm. And to me, and so it was really wild, basically during McNally's talk to, to, to look, to look up from where I was interviewing McNally, I, I looked up and I was able to like see Bill Mitchell, like just per, in, entranced. And he was just leaning forward in his seat, just like, like this, you're just like just really mesmerized by almost coming face to face with Cooper in a way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and that was the sense that I that I got was that he was really he was really, um, you know. Feeling Cooper vibes in, in a way, I don't know. And, yeah. um, you know, he they even you know i mean they even there they are right there mm -hmm. that's a you know that's, that's mcnally and uh that's a mcnally and uh bill mitchell there talking right um they they spoke several times and you know bill wanted to talk to him about how these hijackings are not victimless crimes and uh right. mcnally said no it's not at all right it was not you know <clears throat> there were lots of victims of my crime you know yeah. a guy nearly paralyzed himself trying to prevent it drunkenly mm -hmm. you know these women now, he may have a relationship with Sharon Weathersby, who's the stewardess that he hijacked, but the other stewardess is a woman named Jane and Diane. They, they want nothing to do with him. Yeah. And, you know, another thing that's important to point out, too, is that Marty served his debt to society. I mean, he, he served how many years in prison? 38. Yeah, almost four decades in prison. So, you know, he more than, than served his debt to society. He served his time. Um, I think he recognizes that what he did was, you know, a foolish endeavor. And, oh, and, of course, you know, so it's not like we're lionizing some guy who, you know, right. got did, so, you know, killed a guy and got off scot free and, you know, thinks it's a big joke. Marty doesn't. So, you know, I yeah. think that's an important distinction, too. It was also interesting uh, talking about Bill Mitchell, not to not to bury Marty here, but um you know, walking through the museum of flight going, I think it was on our way or on our way back on our way to, or on our way back from lunch. I bumped into Bill Grinnell. Hmm. As I said, Bill Grinnell was the guy who um, transported the money from the bank to the airport. And um, Bill was talking up Bill Grinnell that, you know, he had pulled Bill Grinnell and his wife to the side and hmm. chatting about this and that, and, you know, all of the, and so it, it, it was almost as if Bill was fanboying a little bit over these other people who were also involved in this yeah. case and, um, you know, to a certain degree and, and was really interesting. You know, and I don't say that in a, in a, you know, condescending way, but I just mean, you know, I think he, Bill has gotten to a place where he's embracing his part in the, in yes. the case and is really intrigued by those who were also kind of Cooper adjacent, like he was. Um, Cooper Jason, so that's, that's a good way to put that. That, that, yeah. that was that was a very cool sight to see, and and um, you know, hearing them talk and and asking, you know, Bill was asking, you know, well, what time did you get to the airport? Because you know, at this time it was this and that, so they were kind of like comparing notes, and it was just a very cool, very cool right. interaction between two people, um, you know, involved in in this case, and to be able to see that was was a really neat experience. Yeah, and like I remember Mitchell when Bill was listening to McNally talk about his hijacking, and what one of the moments where, where I saw Bill like go like oh, like this was I because I you know specifically had Coopery questions to ask McNally. I said why did you wear a suit? Because see McNally wore a suit and tie just like DB Cooper did, and you know we we as people in the Cooper world we we just assumed that hey this was a businessman who this was his everyday attire. And that's an assumption we make. 
in, in but it's still an assumption. Yeah, because Marty you know? was far from it. Absolutely. This guy was an unemployed gas station worker, right? I mean, he had to, he had to dig this suit out of his closet. And I asked him, I said, why did you wear a suit? And he said, well, because I wanted to blend in. I wanted to look like everybody else. And Bill Mitchell's like, oh, look at that. He was like, geez, like wondering, hey, is, is the guy that I've been thinking about for 50 years, was, was he just some schmo too? Mm -hmm. But I thought he was an executive. You know, mm -hmm. Bill thought he was with the airline or something. Yeah. You know, um, a geeky old yeah, I mean, guy. Marty, Marty could have gone on that plane with like some dungarees and a t-shirt, you know? Right. It wouldn't, but yeah. I mean, it, uh, you know. Uh, yeah. I mean, you know, Richard LaPointe jumped and you know, Richard LaPointe, you know, did his hijacking wearing a Western shirt, a Western shirt and jeans and cowboy boots, you know, but McNally specifically chose a suit and he had, for those who don't know, he had blue jeans and a polo shirt underneath his suit and he changed out of his clothes and threw them out the back of the plane because he said, I didn't want to land on the ground looking like the Skyjacker. Mm -hmm. You know, that was not my, I wanted to look like somebody else when I got there on mm -hmm. the ground, which is smart, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, pretty, pretty interesting. So no, CooperCon was great. I mean, the format is still sometimes a bit rushed. Um, and you know, some of the panels can be uh, redundant in a way. I, I feel like that the, the, there should be, you know, more interesting, uh, different panels. Uh, like I, I, I would like an idea of a panel about victims impact, um, or not just victims impact, but like, what is the ethical, what are the ethical obligations that we as researchers have to name people as suspects? Um, you know, when you name somebody who's dead, I mean, as a suspect, that has trickle down effects to their family, okay. uh, and to people who people who knew them and things like that. And so there are, to me, I know that there are ethical, uh, you know, it was never, you know, like with Verdal, you know, was a suspect who, or a person of interest that I brought up, brought to the vortex with some other people. And that was something I told his, fa we told his family, look, we're not going to publish this in the newspapers. What we could have, you know, he's certainly a fascinating individual who with some connections that could, you know, is interesting, you know, it's interesting things about Verdal that are way more interesting than other suspects who get t TV play. Right. Way more interesting. Right. Um, but we told them, said, look, you know, the Cooper world is very small. There are a few thousand of us. We will keep Vordal as best as we can to just this Cooper world. We yeah. will not go to the news. We're not going to publish anything. And they said, that's cool. We respect that. And that's, right. what that, and that's the way it's going to be unless there's ever a smoking gun found on him. Right. I, 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 will, never, I will never do a news story about Vordal ever. Yeah. I, I, I think there's, a, you know, in, in talking about Cooper Khan and some of its strengths and weaknesses, I think there's an important distinction to be made is that, CooperCon used to be the Cooper and Cooper Symposium back in the day, and yes. the uh, the Cooper Symposium was more research centric. It was more, um, you know, discussing the case, the the evidence, um, revelations, new insights, those types of things. Whereas I think CooperCon now is more of a con, uh, and I not a con as in a scam, but a right. con is like a, a, a convention where it's more about, you know, hey, you get to meet Martin McNally and, you know, hey, you know, let's talk about, you know, how DB, you know, let's have commentary on DB Cooper affected uh, pop culture and those types of things. So yeah. for me as, and I think you who are, I mean, I consider myself a serious researcher, you know, I mean, oh, I, yeah. I, I research the case, I, you know, sure. I'm, I'm trying to find evidence and, you know, uh, I, I'm not just looking to, you know, post funny memes on the Facebook. We are very much in the weeds. We are really in the weeds. So for yeah. someone like me and you who are super nerdy about this stuff, I would like it to be more about research and insight and more of a symposium type yeah. of um, atmosphere rather than a con, a, a con uh, you know, conference uh, or a, um, a convention type of thing, you know, like a comic con or something where you know, it's more about fanboying out and, you know, yeah, right, right, more, right. more common. Uh, what I've with the with the Facebook group and it was actually Bruce Smith who pointed this out to me <clears throat> is. And this is why Bruce doesn't participate as much in the Facebook group other than the fact that he retired. But his comment to me was it's a lot more commentary about the case and less 
investigating and researching. That's a great, this. great and, comment. And there's a lot of people on there who, God bless them, they love talking about Cooper, but no real research is going on. There's no people making phone calls, trying to find out, you know, talking to hydrologists, talking to this person, trying to get a hold of some of the stews who are still alive, trying to get a hold right. of some of the, you know, like there's none of that real investigating, um, except for a very small group of people. It's more just, you know, hey, let me check in and see what funny memes people have posted on the Facebook group or, you yeah. know, what, uh, you know, rather than, hey, this is a, this is a really interesting thing that I've discovered. Um, what do you guys think about this? So I, I'd rather see CooperCon become more research, data, evidence centric, um, and really focus on trying to bring the minds together to solve the case, rather than just kind of a, you know, yeah, a, a con, you know, a. a, a I think a, that's well said. Yeah, I think that's well said. Yeah, that's a great, that's a great comment. That, and and to that point, not to dominate the conversation here, but Tom nice. K had two big revelations. I mean, you can always yeah. count on Tom K at CooperCon to, you know, bring the heat. And I think he did um, this year, uh, first of all, with the um, research into the Thai particles and the weird, um, how do I describe this? The, the, the weirdness of the fact that the top, the back of the Thai seemed to be dirtier than the front of the Thai. Yeah. The, the Thai particles I don't and get it. trying to come up with explanations for that. Um, you know, how that exactly happened, because as somebody who, you know, wore a tie for many, many years, you know, I wasn't cleaning anything off with the back of my tie. No. Um, and, uh, and then the second thing is the, uh, the fact that Tom, I believe, settled the debate about how the money was, was bundled and, um, yes. you know, and, and that kind of put that to bed with the diatom research and the fact that it was currency straps in the middle and then rubber bands on the sides as I have suspected for a long time. And I think sure. you eventually, um, you know, came around as well to that a while ago. So, yeah. um, you know, Tom always brings the heat. So, you know, that's the kind of stuff I'd like to see more of is, you know, Hey, let me do a presentation and show you why I think the drop zone is wrong. Yes. Or, you know, let me, let me do a presentation on why the tie particles could have come from a jet engine or, Whatever the case may be, you know, like, let's put it all out there into the universe and have people vet it and talk about it and really research it because there's a lot of smart people here. But yeah, th yeah, this is an image of how we are pretty <clears throat> confident that the Cooper money looked when it was delivered to Cooper. Mm -hmm. uh, rubber bands on each side, th three to five packets, a, a bundle with a uh, paper strap in the middle right. that would have disintegrated in days, really. Really, um, yeah. So the yeah. fact that there's no paper strap found is is not is irrelevant. It really irrelevant, yeah. Because I mean, I the you know paper lasts I think at the most three months out in the wild, yeah. so exposed to elements. So it certainly yeah. would have completely disintegrated after. Well, let's years. You know, honestly, let, let, let's talk through this. I mean, for people, I mean, we're, we'll get we'll get in the weeds here. You know, basically, what Tom. Another thing that Tom has not truly announced yet but what you know, it's been discussed about it is that the the cooper money did not have silt on it right uh which would which would be indicative of money that had been exposed to a flood right and frankly i'm surprised that he didn't mention that because that was something that um i know he and i have discussed privately and i was under the impression that that was going to be part of his presentation at CooperCon. And that was more or less something that he just kind of shared privately over, you know, yeah. dinner. Um, but yeah, the fact that the money was quote unquote clean, clean, that it did not look as if it had been exposed to disturbed water, silty water, muddy um, water, essentially muddy water, yeah. because, you know, and I learned something new is that uh, he told me that diatoms are quite large compared to yeah. silt. So, you know, you think of it in terms of like a, 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 a quart of milk versus a shot glass. I mean, that's really kind of the difference in size between yeah. a diatom, which is larger, and a piece of silt, which is quite small. So if a diatom could penetrate to the interior of a bill, you would expect silt to do so, too. So, you know, I, I really don't I don't have an explanation for it. I'd like Tom to, to speak to that more. 
rather than draw, you know, drawing any more conclusions. Yeah, I, yeah, I have no idea. I really, I don't, I don't know. I, I do know that the um, that the uh, Ingrams washed the bills. So is it possible that it that the silt was washed off? I really don't know. I, I, Tom I really said he didn't think so. I asked yeah. Tom that. He said he said that it didn't wash the diatoms off. So <laughs> correct. But then again, I don't know how the difference in uh, how much a diatom sticks to a bill versus a piece of silt. I don't know. I, you know, I, I'm I'm really talking about you know talking out of my rear end because I have no idea. Um, but it is a perplexing thing, and um, I think it's something. Hopefully, that Tom will elaborate more on in the future because I think you know it. Um, it you know it deserves. Because, you know, my contention has always been that it, the money ended up on Tina Barr as one bundle, as mm -hmm. he says that it did, and then was buried in floodwaters mm -hmm. under flood sediment. If there's no silt on it, then it couldn't have been exposed to floodwaters, silty water. But it was waterlogged. <clears throat> but it was, and it was somehow so, buried under sand, which right. is, you know, comprised of silt. So, um, you know, does that... I, I I guess at this point it's indicative of human burial. Yeah, I, mean, it, I, guess, it, I guess that's the best explanation as of right and now. And we don't like that. It, yeah, and that's the it's thing. not a good one. It's not a good no. explanation, but it's probably the best working one we have. Yeah, neither of us are people who are or you know Cooper buried it there to throw to throw off the feds right. theory. Yeah. But but the evidence right seem might seem to indicate that someone walked over there and dipped it in the water to make it look like it had been waterlogged and well, that, a hole. That's, that's the weird thing about all of this is the money had to get wet before yeah. it got buried entirely like, waterlogged like what, submerged submerged immersed <laughs> like not like dropped and then immediately picked up after like you know or someone spilled something on it like yeah. it was in the water for a few minutes if not more and then picked up and then buried like why you know yeah uh, and, and, it, and 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 as we've discussed the weird thing is that nobody was looking at the columbia river if you're if you're db cooper and you want people to think you died you thought you make it look like it washed up from lake merwin of course yeah i mean in <laughs> 1980 when the money was yeah. found nobody was looking near vancouver it was no. all aerial amboy lake merwin the merwin dam lewis river yeah. that was that was you know that was the ground zero yeah, yeah so if i'm db cooper and i'm thinking well shoot I'm feeling the heat. Let me throw the FBI off. Let me take a day trip to Lewis River. Leave it, you know, next to the, you know, on the banks of the Lewis River. Hopefully somebody will come across it. Right. You know, yeah, why, that, it's, you know, it's, and I said this, I did a, a Facebook Live a while ago, and I said it so many times that it became a meme, is like, why Tina Bar? Of all the places for someone to leave money, why there? You know, like what, what? distinction what significance does that particular location have um you know i know people have tried to say you know tina bar tina mucklow and trying to draw that conclusion that's always seemed a little hokey to me but but hell i mean hell maybe <laughs> you know but i mean cooper I mean, cooper getting the bills wet and throwing it in a hole is hokey too so yeah yeah i mean <laughs> you're like me i have theories and opinions on the case but like, if some new piece of evidence is presented, like yeah. you got to consider it. Like, I'm willing to change my mind. You know? Yeah, we're not married to this. I mean, that's uh -huh. the whole thing. It's uh -huh. like, there's nothing. No. There's nothing sacred in this case to me. I, Absolutely I don't, nothing. No, there's I don't, no I'm not, hill I don't that care. I'm willing to die on. No. No, and absolutely not. And uh, speaking of CooperCon, one hill that I will not die on anymore is uh, Cooper having brown eyes. Um, Jude Mora made a great. You know, I'm I'm not sure if you were there or not, but we were in that hotel bar. No, but Jude I heard Morrow, the story. Yeah, Jude Morrow from Ireland walks in and says, "Hey, everybody, what color are my eyes?" And you know, this isn't like we're not inside like a, a U-boat. It's not like that dark. It is a bar with ambient lighting, the same as you'd see on a plane, probably. And I looked at him and I said, "Oh, you've you've got brown eyes for sure." And he goes. And he pulled out his phone and turned his flashlight. And it's like, little my eyes are green. And his eyes are like Irish looking green, Ireland green. I was like, oh my God. And so I I will not rule out anybody unless they've got bright blue eyes. That's still, a, a, I mean, because I looked around the table at everybody 
you know, to look at everybody else and everybody else seemed to have dark eyes too, except for the people who had really light blue eyes. That was not brown looking, but everybody else, green, hazel, and they all look brown to me. Yeah. You and know, so, it's funny in a general sense, the description, like, you know, he's been described as darker complected, swarthy, right? But then so was Marty McNally. And Marty yeah. McNally's got the same complexion as you or I. I mean, we are, you know, white as a sheet. Uh, so, yeah. you know, I mean, we're we're both Irish. We got uh, that pale Irish skin. I'm basically translucent. You know, I'm just in some favorable lighting right now. But yeah, um, it, it's, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, so, McNally I mean, was... The fact that Cooper was described as dark, you know, darker complected or swarthy, Latin. I mean, so was Marty. So you wonder, you know, and then you as a as someone who's an attorney and you've been in court cases, you know that people in, in when dealing with with an aggressor oftentimes oh, yeah. will make them monsterize. Scary. They're bigger, they're darker, they're angrier. Yeah, they really the are. gun is this big. Yeah, yeah. They, the, they, they tend know, to make it's a sword, more. it's not a dagger, you know. It's exactly. yeah, they, basically so, they monsterize the threat. Right. So you wonder if maybe the complexion isn't accurate either you know if maybe that's you know sort of a you know how, how accurate can the description be yeah um, you know uh so the only thing that uh, his complexion is one thing that i do because his complexion was also noted to be olive by dennis lens and also by uh Hal williams who were guys who had no right. reason to remember him as a threat now and, and, and that's but that brings you back to a larger point is the fact that people who are darker complected that where they have darker complexion whether they be latin or italian you know mediterranean etc tend to have brown eyes you know sure darker, darker yeah so i mean i would err on the side of him having brown tends eyes to go, tends to go sure. with brown eyes obviously there are outliers but typically if you have like darker complected skin like like you know latin skin or or hispanic yeah. skin olive skin and you have bright green eyes or bright blue eyes that's going to stick out and be very very noticeable so well i mean look uh, very likely our florence schaffner is almost certainly our best witness in my opinion um yeah. and it's not tina but it's florence and yeah. florence actually says in you know minutes after leaving the plane to the fbi he had a latin appearance mm -hmm. i mean yeah i mean she had just she had just left the guy she had just right. squeezed past him to go get her purse right you know, and for literally five worth, minutes earlier. For what it's worth, I recently watched the Unsolved Mysteries episode from the 80s again on YouTube. Mm -hmm. And um, and she's quite clear in there. Now, granted, that's decades hence. Um, but, you know, she did say, I remember distinctly everything about him, especially or, or including the color of his eyes and, you know, his brown eyes. So, yeah. you know, even in when, when did that episode come out? 87, 89, 88. 88. Yeah. So, you know, yes, that was years afterwards. But, you know, she's still saying he had brown eyes. So there's no equivocation on her part, you know. Um, yeah. So. But yeah. yeah, it's it's how much stock to put into what she says that later on. I don't know. I mean, because yeah. like I said, we, we've got documents, you know, where. Well. The only thing is that it aligns with what she stated immediately after the hijacking. You know yes. What I mean? Like it's it's yes. not as if she's saying 17 years later, well, they could have been green. You know, yeah. I mean, it's it's it, it her her statements align. In in uh, keeping with the description and the sketches, you've got a little revelation too that you came across as far as the the a new little tidbit yes. of information. So you want well, to just for anybody. That? Yeah, well, I'll put that. Put I'll put this up first, though. This is a, uh, you know, uh, so, so something from the FBI files here. You know, it's, this is from 1976. This is Schaffner saying it's been five years since the hijacking, and she seriously doubts whether or not she could identify the individual from from photos. Yeah, and, she, and that she would have to see him in person. So right. Flo's memory was already gone in 1976. Right. Um, and for Tina, it's even earlier. I mean, you know, Tina. I mean, we're talking about. 1972 mm -hmm. uh less than a year later uh, uh tina is saying that that she can't really recall what he looks like anymore tina tina blames uh tina blames uh the the bing crosby sketch she says the prevalence of this sketch has has made me 
it's probably influenced me to mm -hmm. think that he looked like that. And I've mm -hmm. kind of forgotten what the real guy looked like, mm -hmm. um, which I think is, you know, it, it's pretty weird. And, you know, Tina, like I said, people, people will wonder, you know, why, why Tina, you know, uh, isn't the best witness. Well, you know, look at, you know, look, for example, here's this document, you know, she says, she pointed out that during her, during, during her contact, he was seated, seated on her side and that she only saw his side profile. She never observed him from straight ahead. And most of the time he was whispering in her ear. And therefore she was not in a good position to observe his facial features in great detail. I mean, that is straight from the horse's mouth. That is Tina right. Mucklow in 1972 saying, I can't recall uh, what yeah. he looked like because I, I didn't look at him. <clears throat> yeah. I was scared probably, you know. Yeah, and I don't doubt Tina, uh, but it seems odd because she did see him apparently putting on the shoe, checking yeah. the packing cards, you know, doing these things before she was ordered to go to the front. So it's, you know, she was standing and looking at him doing certain activities, you know, maybe not right up close, but I mean, I've been on a 727-51 and they're not, they're like a flying bus. Like it's not a big aircraft. So yeah. um, there's not a lot of space in there. So I don't doubt. Yeah, I don't know. But again, it, you it know. Just, it seems odd to me that she wouldn't, maybe she was scared to look him in the eye. Listen, I don't know. I'm, yeah. I'm guessing. I don't, I don't know. know. I mean, yeah, Tina has always been, I mean, the way I write about it in my book is that, you know, people have, I feel like that she understood the responsibility of being the, quote, primary witness, really. She understood that she was regarded as that. And so she knew she had a responsibility. So Tina when you read the FBI files, she's always very cautious. She always disclaims everything she says. I mean, you know, there's even, you know, she even says, um, you know, for example, this is what she says. Uh, basically, uh, she says uh, she admitted that because of the time lapse, she is getting somewhat foggy and recalling his exact appearance. Uh, you know, she says that um, she just can't you know, picture it anymore. And so she's kind of disclaiming, saying, look, I'm criticizing the sketch, but don't take my word for it, please. Don't don't change the narrative of the whole thing just because of what I say. Um, but as far as the revelation with the sketches, good Lord, I mean, this, to me, this is really, I mean, kind of revelatory, really, for me. Um, you know, as many of you know, I'm in the process of writing a pretty, I guess, epic uh, book about the hijacking, kind of an all-encompassing nonfiction book, just straight nonfiction, no theories, no suspects, you know, just the nonfiction. <clears throat> and so writing writing 8,000 words on the sketches, you got to really dig deep into the files uh, to see how these sketches were made and things like that. And what I came across was that as everyone knows, we have multiple sketches. You know, we have all these uh, different men. I mean, right there. I mean, this is, I mean, one, two, three. I mean, this is arguably four different individuals. Um, you know, that initial sketch there is a different guy than the Bing Crosby sketch. That hoodlum down there from August of 72, Composite B, is a, is a different guy. You know, he's different than the Cary Grant sketch there. So this is four different individuals, really. And yet we have the stewardesses pretty much unanimously liking all of them, um, except except Florence Schaffner was really adamant that this one from 112571, that this guy here uh, was was not a good likeness to the hijacker. Uh, she was shown this sketch was made the night of the hijacking without witness help. It was Who made, made it? Uh, I don't know, a, 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 some agent in Las Vegas made it because it, it was faxed. Uh, they made it with using Tina's description, written description. OK, they didn't talk to Tina or whoever this person was who drew it wasn't there. So it was not made with Tina's help. She wasn't there with the guy. And so they did not see this until the next morning or the next afternoon. Uh, they got into many. They got back to Minneapolis around four <laughs> o'clock that afternoon. And uh, this sketch had been faxed over and uh, they looked at the sketch and they said, well, Alice thought it looked good. Tina said, looks pretty good. Uh, Florence says, no way. 
she was adamant, as the 302 says, it says she was adamant that this was not a good likeness of D.B. Cooper. Um, and she said, I would like to go dig around in this sketchbook. Uh, and that's what she did. She dug around uh, in the FBI's uh, facial identification catalog. She dug around and uh, she she pulled out um, an old mugshot. And she said, this guy looks like him. This guy right here, which was called KK51. Uh, she said, this guy looks like the hijacker. She says, except his hair line was a little lower, Cooper's, and his ears didn't protrude so much. But otherwise, she says, this looks just like him. Now, this was the day after the hijacking. OK, remember that. All right. So uh, he she picks this guy out. So the day after. And to that be clear, day, that guy doesn't look anything like the previous sketch. In my no, opinion. not at all. I mean, they're, they're very different looking people. I mean, then this this other guy i mean you know the, the, the these two are different different folks mm -hmm. altogether. so that florence says like i want Robert redford yeah this guy's kind of i don't know what he is but he's not this dude and their ages are different too so anyway so the next day roy rose flies out there okay and roy rose sits down with the stewardesses and roy rose creates um the uh of the bing crosby sketch here um which this has been colorized by me the original was not in color um, but he created this sketch sitting down with Florence, Alice, and Tina. All right. Well, Florence Schaffner liked this drawing. She goes, oh, yeah, I like that drawing very much. Uh, Tina Mucklow says this drawing looks almost 100% like him. Uh, Alice said it is an excellent likeness of the hijacker. So they seem to like the sketch. Um, this sketch was shown to the witnesses. They seem to like him, too. Um, Really, the only criticism that they had with this sketch was that they said it, basically he needed to look older. This guy looks late 20s, early 30s, yeah. maybe. That's always been my criticism of this sketch is that he looks like a 12 year old child. I mean, he, he yeah. looks, he looks youthful. like feminine he looks in a very way. Very youthful, looks very young, and he looks very feminine. He's got very yeah. feminine features. So, um, yeah. you know, I, 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 yeah, I, uh, I and think so he they didn't be aged. Yeah, they liked him, except they wanted they wanted him to be older and they wanted his chin to be pointier. OK, they wanted his chin to be pointier. They wanted him to be older um, and they wanted his upper lip to be shaved down. Uh, so upper lip, not so pronounced. So really, if you put those changes onto it, this is my conception. Um, he's going to look like this a little bit. OK, this is a little bit older guy. Uh, his his lip is shaved down. His nose is wider. They said make his nose wider. As you can see, Bing's nose is like this little Michael Jackson nose. It's weird looking, right? Um, so they said widen his nose also. So you, you show up, you get this guy here. Um, this is kind of what I would Man, do he's this. green, but, but he looks like Marvin the Martian. Yeah, I know. It's hard to, I've tried to make olive skin, man. I, I can't do it. Uh, I'm not good at it. Um, now my sketch that I made kind of has that skin. That's a good skin tone there. Yeah. Um, that's more realistic, but that's my sketch there, but that's not me. But anyway, so being this guy received mostly positive reviews, mm -hmm. but the problem was the FBI spent the next seven, eight months fending off reports from every, every, everybody was calling saying, Oh, my neighbor kid who, just got back from Vietnam. He's all messed up. Looks just Richard like this. Richard McCoy, 27-year-old Richard McCoy. Yeah, rack straws. That kid. I mean, these younger guys, these, you know, and most hijackers were in their 20s. McNally was 28. McCoy was 27, you know. This, uh, Hetty was 24. LaPointe's 22. They're younger guys. It's yeah. a younger man's game for the most part. But he, the FBI was mad about Bing. They didn't like Bing. It was bothering them. So they said, hey, so they went in uh, Charlie Farrell, who is the lead case agent, went back and he reviewed the old the old files from a year earlier when they made this sketch. And in, rev in reviewing it, he came across an, a document that was dated December 2nd, 71, which this sketch, if you look here where it is, this sketch was made 1127 and 1130 of 71. Well, so. He comes across a document dated December 2nd where Florence Schaffner says, I hate the sketch. I don't like it. I, I'm very adamant that this does not look like Cooper. And she went, goes and, and in, in this document from December 2nd, she picks out uh, the KK51 mugshot 
But for some reason, Charlie Farrell was mistaken and didn't realize that this December 2nd dated document was referencing an 1125 interview where she was critiquing uh, this guy. You know, he messed up and it was just, just a mistake. He, he just kind of brain farted, I guess, and mixed up. So he thought that Bing, you know, needed to be more like this guy. Okay. Um, because he thought that Flo was criticizing the Bing sketch. Well, um, so what they did is instead of just aging Bing up, you know, they overhauled the sketch. He sent, uh, Charlie Farrell sent to Roy Rose, this KK51 said, hey, this needs to be your starting point for this new sketch. And that's how, you know, and that's how you end up, you know, with someone looking more like that, you know. Um, and, you know, and that's really how you get that guy. Although really, if you look at it, though, if you look at them, uh, really what he looks like, um, you know, he's more like, uh, where is it? Uh, you know, this guy here, uh, KK51, you can tell the inspiration there uh, between, you know, KK51, mm -hmm. you know, the and, mouth and, uh, especially. Well, really, if you look at it, also the eyes are identical. Mm hmm. I mean, I mean, they're literally identical. It, it's a copy and paste job between yeah. the eyes there. Yeah. But that's their starting point, you know, between these two. And so that's why that's how we end up with, you know, that's why there's, there's this crazy jump from Bing to this hoodlum looking guy. So I mean, that is a remarkable jump. Yeah. So what's your conclusion? I mean, what, what, what conclusions can you draw from this? It seems <sighs> to me that Bing is the best uh, comp, uh, composite A and compo you know composite A is th the best likeness of Cooper that we have. Is that an accurate statement? Or uh, I mean, roughly. Well, it's weird because obviously all of the witnesses also. I mean, they all like this guy here. Um, Florence said this is as Florence said that Cooper would be easily recognized by this sketch. Tina Mucklow says this is as close as you can get to him. Now, remember, they are saying these words in January 1973. Right. So, and that's well over a year later. They were saying the same thing about B days after the hijacking. Yeah, but yeah, they, they liked this. I mean, this guy was 100% like him, according to Mucklow. Right? Within, within days, days after the hijacking. So... I, it's a weird, if I had to choose, I mean, it's almost like by default, you go with the document that is closest to the event, really. Yeah. I mean, if I had um, to draw conclusions based on that, on your finding, I would say that Bing is probably the most accurate representation of, of Cooper within reason. I mean, I, it has its flaws, obviously, like we've discussed. I think it looks too young. Um, yeah. And I, I think... <clears throat> One of the problems with the Cooper, I mean, I'm not a big fan of sketches either. As somebody who comes from the Zodiac world and how, um, you know, ubiquitous the the Zodiac sketch is in terms of how many people right. you can pin to it. Um, right. But, uh, you know, I'm not a big fan of sketches, but it seems to me that other than the fact that it looks young and looks happy, I mean, the guy in Bing looks like he's, you know, about to go on a Ferris wheel ride. Yeah, and a lot of that is in his eyes too, and I want yeah. to discuss that so too. It's, the it's eyes, kind of, he's got like this young, whimsical expression on his face. So right, and I don't trust his eyes at all because check this out, folks. So the only people who claim to have seen Cooper's eyes were uh, Florence Schaffner, obviously, um, um, Dennis. Hal Williams. Well, Dennis was of no use, but Hal Williams said he Dennis would have seen his eyes, but he paid no attention and he admitted it. They never they never sought his advice on the sketches because Dennis Lynn said I would not recognize him if I saw him again. He just a vibe, I guess, maybe skin tone. Now, didn't, didn't Cord didn't Cord claim to have seen him before he put on his glasses or no? Um, so at some point no, during Robert Gregory. It's Robert Gregory, again, who I, I just don't know about him. But Robert Gregory says that he that at one point he went to the bathroom and Cooper had taken his sunglasses off. Now, I, I this must maybe this was early in the hijacking. Maybe this is right after they got on the plane when they were doing still doing drink service and he, he and Cooper didn't have them on yet. 
that's the only thing I can think about because Cooper kept them on as far as we know. Once he put them on, they stayed on. Um, but, but anyway, so the only people who saw his eyes were Gregory, Williams, and Schaffner. They wanted, the FBI wanted to make this sketch here with eyes. So they went around and they said, hey, hey Florence, do you, do you remember what his eyes look like? She goes, no. I don't remember any details about his eyes other than his eye color, essentially. Um, and they went to Gregory and then Hal Williams, and Gregory and Hal Williams picked out eyes from the eye catalog. And I don't know which person picked these eyes. I don't know if it's Gregory or if it's Williams. But these eyes here are straight copy and paste from the FBI's facial identification catalog. It's, they're just random eyes. Okay, so it, Bing's eyes were picked by men who had no reason to pay attention to his eye shape. So you you really can't trust Bing's eyes at all, mm. in my opinion. So really, this sketch here pr pr probably is the closest one. Now, one characteristic that everybody seems to agree that Cooper had is a narrow, thin face. Narrow, yes. So, you know, kind of a long face rather than, I mean, I kind of have a blockhead, um, you know, but, you know, people people describe, it seems like across the Universal. board. Universal. Universal. Across the board, every witness says Cooper had a thin, narrow face or words to that effect. Yeah. Long face. Well, yeah, and let's look, yeah, and if you look at, you know, the people, um, you know, the people who that they picked out, like, there were two men whose photographs that, that's, that they were shown. So what they used to do is they used to go show photographs to the, of suspects, mixed in with other people's pictures and things to these eyewitnesses. And uh, the two men who were selected, you know, and said, hey, this looks like Cooper, um, are these two guys here. Um, you know, this is on the left there. That's Donald Sylvester Murphy. And on the right here is a guy named Alan Cooper. Um, and I really think that if you look at like their face shapes, really, um, they look similar to, you know, to at least the, especially on the right there. If you look at Alan Cooper's face, um, yeah. I can see a lot That's of hard to tell that. Because there's shadows there, but yeah, but you can tell. I, I see similarities in this and and that. Yeah, yeah. You know, how old th is the guy on the left in that previous photo? Okay, so Donald Sylvester Murphy was 50 years old when that was taken. Okay. And he Alan Cooper, old. Is, I mean, his, his yeah, he's older. Looks wrinkled. He's got the the kind of the the turkey waddle, you know. Right. He looks. Like and what's fascinating, old. what's fascinating about this photo on the left here, is that when that was shown, now remember they used to do these when they would show these photographs to of suspects to the stewardesses, they would lay out ten ten at a time, you know random random photographs of people who look like the person that they're who look like the suspect because mm -hmm. they don't want to influence the person so pick, pick this person here right and uh i believe it's eight or maybe eight or nine of our 10 eyewitnesses picked this guy on the left like all of them did and in fact we have a 302 where florence Schaffner says this guy on the left here looks more like cooper than any photograph she had ever seen out of the hundreds she had been shown. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Bill Mitchell, we have a 302 where Bill Mitchell is shown and he picks this photograph and Bill Mitchell says the exact same thing. It's it's almost like uncanny. Mm -hmm. Bill Mitchell literally says, this guy looks more like the hijacker than any photograph you've ever shown me. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. Cooper is gonna look like Donald Murphy. He's just mm -hmm. probably, almost certainly. Mm -hmm. And Alan Cooper here on the right, this isn't the photograph that she saw. Now this one on the left is, is the exact photograph that they saw. That is the photograph they picked out. The one on the right here of Alan Cooper is not. I I don't I have FOIA'd for the photograph that they saw of Alan Cooper. I've not received that back yet. Mm -hmm. This mm -hmm. is just one that I found of him. Mm -hmm. And but Tina, when Tina saw this photograph of Alan Cooper, not not this one here, but when she saw the photograph of, Co of Alan Cooper, she said that it gave her that she got a weird feeling in her body. Mm -hmm. So, and those two guys that I'm looking at right now are different ages. I mean, the yeah, guy, for sure. But I don't know what is, the guy on the left is older. The guy on yeah. the right, he looks like he's in his mid thirties. Yeah. So I don't know, if, but maybe it's just the face shapes or what. Yeah. Yeah. Um, They're not but, great but, photographs. So no, no, I, another characteristic too, that <clears throat> has been made a lot about because there's a, a Ray Rhodes interview with his grandson, I believe. And he yeah. makes a comment that all of the 
people that he spoke with um, across the board said that Cooper had a pouty lip or sure. a, a bottom lip that's kind of stuck out a little bit. <clears throat> um, what do you make of that in terms of the FBI files? Does that come up in any of the witness statements? It does. Yeah. And, and really fascinating is we have actually a document where Tina Mucklow, let me see if I can, let me see if I can pull this up here uh, from my little files here is uh, we have actually documentation um, from Tina where, yeah, here it is. Let me, let me upload this. So in this document here, it's kind of hard to see, but this is a mugshot of a guy named Alvin Curtis Hartley. And uh, Tina Mucklow, when she saw this photograph, she goes, hey, this looks nothing like Cooper, but his lower lip looks very similar. So you can't like it's only it's impossible to I had to FOIA. I have FOIA for the for the high resolution version of this. You know what's you know what's interesting here too is that picture appears to show him with a turkey waddle as well. He's yeah, this guy's little, got one for sure. Got a little saggy neck there. Yeah, but she, whatever it was, she liked that guy's lower lip. Now, and this was in 1973 when she saw Alvin Curtis. So she remembers two years later that Cooper had a distinctive lip. And she says, that guy's lip looks like Cooper. And it's like, so he, he must have really had something going on. In fact, in the 302s, we have Alice Hancock and we have uh, Tina Mucklow both using the terms in different years, actually. One's in 72, one's in 73 in different years using the term uh, pouty. They use the exact same language, pouty. And I have always thought that this is why we have several witnesses saying that Cooper looked disinterested. Right. Um, he had a very, they said he had a very, let's get this over with look. He had disinterested face. And to me, that speaks to a pout, like a kid pouts when they're right. bored, you know. Right. You know, whatever, you know. Right. And that's kind of how I you know, interpret that um, now, to be. I have it in my head and you look at, you read so many things, man. I don't know. You're probably not like me because you're probably more organized, but I'll read a document or I'll read a book or I'll read a, a, a something and I'll get an impression in my head and then not remember where I got that idea from. So mm -hmm. I, I get the impression. There's an impression in my head that Cooper, when he was sitting on the aircraft was slouching or yeah. kind of punched over, you know, kind of either to the you know, punched hunched over forward or kind of slouching back in his seat. Yeah, it says that. I and, mean, and Robert I Gregory, yeah. That can also cause your face to take on a certain pouty expression or, you know. Well, I don't know, but I would say not because the reason I would say not is because one of the people who said that he looked disinterested was mm -hmm. uh, Hal Williams. But I, um, if somebody's slouching, that, you know, I mean, if you, you know, I, I've taught school for many, many years. When I stu see a student slouching in their seat, I can tell that they're not interested. You know, people who are interested sure. are leaning forward, you know, they're engaged, you know, sl slouching back in your seat, kind of slumped down is indicative of someone who is, isn't really, doesn't uh, really un engaged. Uh, Correct. Uh, Correct. Well, here's the lips here. Okay. So here we go. Um, here's, these are the lips from all the sketches. OK, um, and you can see this. This is these are these are uh, like this is Roy Rose said that all they said was he was a middle aged person dressed in a suit, dark complexion and a sort of protruding lower lip. Now, my question is, who is they? Uh, he's talking about the stewardesses. All the, the uh, three is, twos? Yes. This is him describing what they told him when he interviewed them the day two days after the hijacking. Um, and if you like I said, if you look at his lips in the sketches, they are. And what's interesting, so, so this what, yeah. um, the one on the far right is the one that uh, is the sketch that was drawn for Unsolved Mysteries. Mm -hmm. And obviously, Florence Schaffner still remembered a weird lip because mm -hmm. that's incorporated into the Unsolved Mysteries sketch 17 years later. Yeah. So the one, the one that's third from the left is really, really sticking out. Yeah, that's that's uh, what's a, that, that's the uh, that's the hoodlums mm -hmm. lip there. Mm -hmm. You know, that one that's, is that's really pronounced. And it's it, it was too extreme actually. Yeah, and um, all, they and said that looks like he's got a uh, an underbite, you know, or his jaws protruding. Yes, his entire jaws protruding. One yeah. of the criticisms of the hoodlum was that his mouth looked unnatural, mm -hmm. and so they just you know they just you know shifted it to this, which is more natural looking, I suppose. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, that's how they did. It. But yeah, so that's what. Uh, but the whole point, I guess, going back to what we were saying, is that really 
um, we have this extreme jump from being to comp B based on a mistake that was made by Charlie Farrell, thinking that they were criticizing Bing when they weren't. Mm -hmm. um, and really, just it's almost weird to think about that if, if Charlie Farrell had not misunderstood the date, we would never have the Cary Grant sketches. Mm -hmm. Probably. I, mm -hmm. I mean, I don't think so. I don't think they we would they would have had would, no reason to. We probably would have gotten an aged. Uh, an yeah, aged this guy. Person. Right. Yeah, we'd have gotten except less green looking, but you know, I mean, we'd have gotten that or you know, something the other like thing this. That's interesting about yeah, I think that's I think that's uh, in my opinion that's probably what Cooper looked like. You yeah, know, and that's pretty realistic. Um, but uh, the other thing that's I always I, I always thought interesting is that the the later sketches always portray Cooper with five o'clock shadow, which is yeah. interesting to me because. That would make sense because if you assume that he got up in the morning and shaved, hey, man. Like most men did back in the day, and you know, men who have darker hair tend to yep. have you know five o'clock. You know, they're you know my hair perhaps even lighter, so ethnic. my five o'clock shadow doesn't stick out as much. But people with darker hair tend to have more pronounced five o'clock shadow. By five o'clock, that's why it's called five o'clock shadow because by five o'clock in the evening, it's all, you've already got some stubble going on. So. Right. Um, yeah. And, and perhaps by even the air, yeah. By the time the aircraft landed in in Seattle, the guys probably got some some five o'clock shadow happening. Yeah, you can see where they put the shade there a little bit. Mm -hmm. You and know, that looks like he's just... got dip in his lip, man. I mean, he, it looks like he's got some chaw down there. Yeah, yeah. They eventually, like I said, it, they they morphed. Like this guy is the transition between the hoodlum and. Uh, in yeah. this dude here, you know. So do you think, I, mean, I know this is going to be an extreme take, and it's just, just a question. Do you think that based on Farrell's error, that we should disregard the later sketches, the hoodlum sketches, et cetera? I don't think so. Um, I think Because, I mean, probably... they, were, they were based on errors, right? I mean, they, they introduced well, a sketch that really shouldn't have been introduced, right? I guess, yeah, maybe. But I, I guess... The only rede what redeems it a little bit to me is that they do somewhat resemble KK51, which Schaffner was like, that's him. And so it's weird that they didn't incorporate. I don't see anything in KK51 in Bing. No, me I either. And I was just about to say that. And Flo, and Flo says that she agrees with both of them. Yeah, incongruent. it's very incongruent. So I don't I don't. I, it just make God. I mean, it's just witness, you know, and, you know, just weird, you know, and so where is the one? You, while you're doing that, let me ask you a question. In your experience as an attorney in the courtroom, have you had much experience with identifying people off of sketches? Never. Really? I've, I've literally never, I don't even think, I've never been, or I've never met a sketch artist. <laughs> I've never... I've no, I've literally, I have no experience with sketch artists. So um, when they, I, when they send you to Hogwarts and you learn about law, do they teach you about like sketches and, and the, no. how the accuracy of sketches or how, how the closest, the, how, what kind of validity sketches have in terms of witness statements? And no, the closest you would get to that is, uh, is learning about the frailty of memory, I would say. Um, learning that witness statements are are flawed. I mean, we did it. We did an experiment one time where like somebody came in the room and like ran out of the room, and uh, the professor's like, "Okay, describe that person." And I mean, it was bad. I mean, it was really bad. Um, and I, I, I tell I've told the story before that I I prosecuted a case one time where a person was kidnapped. Um, and uh, now, kidnapping doesn't just mean you're thrown in a trunk and whisked away. Kidnapping can mean legally kidnapping is anytime you're you are restrained from having freedom by somebody. Right. So th 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 it was two burglars who broke into this per woman's house and they tied her up to like a chair, like you'd see in a movie almost. And they ransacked her house for two hours, coming in and out. And uh, there was a police lineup. They did a lineup about two days later. And she not only failed to identify the guy, she picked the wrong guy out. Okay. Now, this is a woman who sat there and watched some people in her house for two hours, and she still picked the wrong person. Mm -hmm. 
So it, it's just, I don't know. I mean, it, it's, you know, you hear a lot of anecdotal things about, you know, like I said, the only things I would, I, I think he must have had the lip. Mm -hmm. that, that's too frequent. Yeah. He had a narrow face. That's literally everybody. Yeah. And, and I tend to think he did have a darker complexion because just based on the fact that Dennis Lenz said he, said he had olive skin in the airport with the brightly lit airport mm -hmm. and that Florence Schaffner said he had a Latin appearance, mm -hmm. that, yeah. that kind of lends toward that. Those are the things. And, you know, when, when, when I made this sketch, when I made my own Cooper sketch, which is this guy here, I did what I did with him was I kind of blended elements of KK51 with Bing, uh, and also I incorporated elements from like some of these guys here. Well, you know, I think he's the, certainly that sketch. He's certainly, in my opinion, aged properly. I mean, he looks yeah, like Bing at an appropriate age. He does not look like a 15-year-old high school sophomore. Where no, Bing I, does. This guy looks 40, late 40s, Yeah, which yeah. the FBI said that the FBI deduced their deduction was that Cooper was About approximately 40, 48, 48, 48 years yeah. old. So um, I would say that this is probably your, your best representation um, of him. Um, and, and I mean, I'm, this is just me throwing this out there like, like I'm some super knowledgeable guy. But doing this to Bill Mitchell? Uh, I've not shown that to Bill Mitchell. Like I said, I don't, as Bill Mitchell says, do you remember the face of a substitute, of a substitute teacher you had in fifth grade one time? Yeah. No. You know, 50 yeah. years later, even he's like, well, no. you know, that's the thing is that when we talk about the witnesses, a lot of the witnesses had fleeting encounters with Cooper. I mean, even, Very even Flo's encounter was fleeting. You know, she sat with him for a period of time. She spoke with him for a period of time, but I mean, within what? I'd have to go back and look at my my timeline, but I mean, I think within 15 or 20 minutes, she was in the cockpit. Yeah. Um, you know, none of the flight crew did. Uh, Alice, I guess, did for Briefly. an unknown period of time. Not much. Not much. The only not person who, So, you know, when we talk about fleeting uh, encounters and, and eyewitness statements, the one person that that is the um, outlier and that is Tina who sat next to him for the better part of what, five hours. Yeah. So, um, you know, but even she says, I never got a look at his face. I never looked at him head on, you know, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. Which, I think a lot of that is just honestly for her, I feel like she didn't want to antagonize him. I mean, you know what I'm saying? This is a guy with a bomb. Yeah. You know, but it, on the it, other hand, she's make, making small talk. Sure. He, 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 he handed them, uh, uh, you know, offered them tips. So, I mean, it's not like he was concealing his actively concealing his face, you know? No. Um, yeah. Yeah. I don't I mean, know. It's, I, it's weird. I don't have an explanation for it. It's yeah. Just, I don't have an, I mean, I, it's, it's Tina in a weird way, almost sometimes, I mean, I don't do know you what think to think she's about just her. shy and equivocating because she's just young and, doesn't want to say the wrong thing, or are we just reading too much or into she her just, behavior? I don't know. I, I think we, uh, you know, I don't know the woman. Uh, you know, I've never met her. I, I don't know. I mean, I, I, by some accounts, I mean, look, the the woman who we met in uh, 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 at, at CooperCon, who had been a mm -hmm. stewardess, she said Tina was a lovely person. Mm -hmm. She worked with Tina Mutlow a lot, mm -hmm. actually. She, mm -hmm. she was great. Alice Hancock. <laughs> Uh, thought the world of Tana Mucklow, actually. Mm -hmm. Bill Radichek. Recent, Bill Rad. Yeah. So I, I, I tend to the thought of Tina. Bill brings Bill Radichek to tears. Yeah. So I, I think that she just didn't want to mess up. I think she understood her responsibility yeah. and was being cautious. I, yeah, I don't, I don't question her courage or her, her, um, her integrity in any way, shape, or form. I just wonder if maybe she's, you know, I mean, I'm the father of a 22 year old, and you know, I can sure. imagine her being put in. Uh, an extremely high stress situation like that. And I wonder if she would, you know, um, you know, in dealing with the federal Bureau of investigations, if she would be, yeah. you know, kind of, uh, I'm not sure, maybe, I don't know, you know, don't, yeah. don't, you know, don't, don't rely on me for every, you know? So I wonder if she would be as, um, 
you know. Uh, well, and we can kind of see that um, the fact that she had a, the fact that she requested a second interview with the FBI yeah. shows that she cared about it because, right. you know, she told them, she called them and said, look, you know, I would like to speak with you guys again because I was frazzled on the night of the hijacking. Right. And right. I think yeah. I've remembered I, I, more. I, if, if we do anything, I would like to put to rest the idea that Tina Mucklow did not fully cooperate with the investigation. Oh, uh, no, God, no. She, she fully cooperated. It, it, the FBI had no complaints about her cooperation or her statements or anything. And, and the fact that she's been cast in negative light by some, uh, yeah. to me, is just really kind of distasteful. But It is distasteful, yeah. And so here's, here's let's, I'll transition uh, briefly here. Let, let, let's talk about, uh, let's talk about somebody uh, who is in this photograph here. Uh, let's talk about that. Okay. Uh, well, for 18 months, I've been looking for a guy that's mentioned in the FBI files named Captain Thomas Spangler. And in the FBI files, Captain Thomas Spangler is the guy that was identified um, as the person who provided the FBI, as who provided the flight path map to the FBI um, that was based on SAGE radar data. And Obviously, there's been a lot of questions surrounding that flight path map, um, and I, you know, I've been looking for this guy to see if we knew anything about him. I know uh, Dr. Robert Edwards, um, the author and, and uh, mathematician, um, has also been looking for this guy probably longer than I have. At any rate, I've posted all kinds of stuff on all kinds of McCord Air Force Base thing, posted his picture, looked for him and exhausted all of my efforts. And then um, over the summer, I got an excited message from you and you can kind of take over from there and tell me how you came about and discovered Tom Spangler. Well, I just, I started, I mean, we, we didn't even know where this guy was from. So I had no leads. Thomas Spangler is not a crazy common name, but it's enough to where it's not, there's whether there's enough of them where I couldn't find the guy without some lead. So I eventually found a, a news article about him uh, where it mentioned that he was from like a uh, Pennsylvania area. And uh, so I kind of backtracked that and looked for, so I started looking for Spangler on news articles in, um, you know, Spangler on news articles uh, from where that county he was from, right? And sure enough, you you find, you know, Doris and Billy Spangler are their son, Thomas Spangler, was just promoted to captain, you know, and you're like, aha, that's the guy, you know. So I and then I was able to, like, kind of just work it back from there. And I eventually got this guy's number and I said, hey, uh, hey, Chris, this is your guy, um, because, like I said, we thought that uh, Spangler made the flight path. We mm -hmm. thought that he was the guy who made the flight path. But as you found out. Yeah. Yeah. What, so I called Spangler in September, um, spoke to him for over an hour on the phone, um, you know, despite his age, you know, I mean, he's, he's getting up there as most of these guys are, you know, they were in their thirties and forties and 72. So, you know, they're, they are no spring chickens, <clears throat> but this guy was sharp as a tack. Um, very, very gentlemanly, very good guy. And, uh, spoke with him for over an hour. And <clears throat> I went into that interview, assuming that he created the map assuming that he's the one that sat down and did the the red crosses and the red uh you know radar ticks on there and and drew the lines and the, put the everything on there i assume that was all him <clears throat> in the course of our conversation i learned that that's not in fact true <clears throat> and the story is is that uh spangler was watching the hijacking like everybody else on tv that night and then either the following day or the day after, and the timeline is a little fuzzy, um, but uh, within, a, within a few days of the hijacking, he was tasked by his commanding officer to go to the SAGE radar blockhouse, which is at McCord Air Force Base. That's where all of the SAGE radar was done and, and where SAGE, the SAGE unit was based. And uh, he went there and wasn't even allowed in the building. He was met at the door. And was basically handed this map and he was handed weather data and he was handed information from Northwest Airlines in terms of when the oscillations were reported and those types of things. And told to do the drop analysis because 
Spangler did not work for Sage. Spangler was a navigator aboard a C-141. He was with the uh, 62nd Airlift Wing based at McCord. And um, he was a drop specialist. His, his job was to calculate um, drift and, and those types of things when they kicked equipment out of the back of these cargo planes. Um, so he would be the ideal guy to figure out, you know, Cooper's drop zone. And that's exactly what he was told to do was to take this map along with other data, other information like weather and calculate Cooper's drop zone. And he said he did that. He said his drop zone map was teardrop shaped and it put Cooper squarely in the uh, lake, squarely in Lake Merwin. Um, the mm -hmm. drop zone was squarely in Lake Merwin. Um, so um, it turns out that that flight path map that you have up there was not created by Tom Spangler, but in fact provided to Tom Spangler by someone at the Sage Radar blockhouse at McCord. Um, um, now Spangler also has the distinction. So that's, that's interesting on its own. The fact that we now have a better idea, we can now eliminate one person from the chain of command or chain of custody right. with the map, um, and who created it. Um, but, but we also have a mystery drop zone map that we've never seen because I've yes. never seen a teardrop shaped drop zone, no. um, from someone other than Paul Soderlund. Um, so where is Tom Spangler's drop zone map? That's somewhere in the ether. Um, and uh, so that's interesting on its face. And then the other thing that's interesting is Tom Spangler was involved in the sled test in January of 1972, in which they um, uh, sent the sleds out the back of the 727 to find out if they could replicate the pressure bump, which in, in fact they did. And in speaking with Tom Spangler about that, um, Spangler was actually sitting behind the pilot seat, um, which was occupied by Paul Soderlund, who was uh, Northwest Airlines Director of Flight Operations Technical. He was flying the aircraft and Spangler was in the cockpit sitting directly behind him in the jump seat, which during the night of the hijacking was occupied by Tina Mucklow. Um, right. So, um, and uh, Spangler was the one that Spangler in the Air Force basically was the one that decided to do sleds because, yeah, that's Tom Spangler's shoulder on the left hand side of that picture there right behind the pilot. And this is Harold Anderson. And this is Harold Anderson. And Harold Anderson looks so young in that picture. He <laughs> does. Um, but uh, so Spangler, the, the interesting story is the FBI originally wanted to roll down, um, you know, those big, uh, they look like, um, Gosh, how do I describe it? They look like TIE fighters in in uh, world, in Star Wars. You know, they have like the round things on the sides and then the, the column in the middle and they use it to wrap wire, you know. Oh, cable. yeah, it's a spool thing, yeah. The spool, spools, exactly right. So that he want the FBI wanted to roll spools, these big spools down the ramp to replicate it. And Spangler and US Air Force said, no, 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 let's use sleds instead. So they rigged up these sleds and Spangler was in charge of rigging up the sleds and putting that together and then spangler also said that he was the one who coordinated having the c-141 um uh, fly adjacent to the uh sled test flight so that they could take photographs um and uh he was the one that arranged that and and had that done um so uh yeah is that the yeah that's the yeah. that's the c-141 right that's the chase plane yeah that's yeah that's the chase plane for the sled test so yeah. <clears throat> now what's interesting is spangler doesn't recall there being video recording being done um mm -hmm. he said that to best of his knowledge it was just photographs but you have evidence to suggest that there's actually a video recording of vhs tape oh i know there is yeah yeah so uh, I, i'm all, all i'm I'm almost positive. Yeah, this was actually this was actually yesterday in, in the vault. This this yeah. this was this image here was yesterday in the vault. Right. This was in the vault. There right. is a video cassette yeah. of the sled test occurring. So, so and yeah, Spangler Spangler wasn't aware of that. He couldn't recall it. He didn't remember. Yeah. He remembered the photographs, didn't recall there being video recording. But I mean, you know, whatever it's 51 years ago, you know, 52 years ago. Let's forgive the guy. Um yeah. <clears throat> but um That's but yeah, pretty damn cool. Him, I asked him about the um, pressure bump, and he said that um, he did not experience a pressure bump when uh, he said that the gauges detected it, 
but that he did not feel anything physically himself, but that he was honestly not really paying attention to it and wasn't attuned to it and, you know, couldn't speak to what the others experienced on the aircraft. So, Mm. um, but, uh, but he didn't, you know, when, when, but he did say that, you know, the sled test proved what they believed. And that was that, um, the pressure, um, what's the word pressure situation, the pressure event, um, that the crew said that they experienced was caused by Cooper leaving the aircraft from the, from the aft stairs and Spangler described exactly what the sled test did. I mean, when the sled left the bottom of the stairs, those stairs kind of sprung back up, slammed against the fuselage, you know, obviously increasing the pressure inside the cabin and, and causing all sorts of pressure um, situations. Yeah. So, and they kept that a secret too. I mean, that was actually a kind of a, almost in a way, a guarded secret that this, that this occurred, that this thing would, that this popping would occur, you know, when, when you yeah, remove they the weight. that to pinpoint the drop zone, the drop of the copycats, of copycats yeah. down the road. So yep. yeah, that was yep. kind of a, an FBI secret for quite and, a while. And that really, that is the ultimate death of the Cooper didn't jump theory. Right. Is that, Cooper would have had Cooper would have had no way of knowing that he right. needed to fake this pressure bump thing. Yeah. Yeah. There's no I, way. I don't think there's any doubt that the pressure, the time of the pressure bump was when Cooper exited the aircraft. I, yeah. I, I don't think there's any doubt about that at all. Uh, and, and it can't be simulated. There was no way for Cooper to fake that or simulate that or even know it or even know it was going to happen. I mean, right. You know, every other copycat caused this same bump. Right. And they told the FBI, they said, I mean, the FBI during these hijacking said, hey, guys, you're going to feel something in your ears when he jumps. Let us know when this happens. And sure enough, right. I mean, they, they I mean, no matter how many decoy parachutes that Richard McCoy threw out the plane, they knew that it, that, it would, that they were just decoys. Right. Um, right. Because they didn't feel the pressure bump yet. He didn't know that he needed, needed to do that. Right. Um, right. 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 So, yeah. yeah. So talking to Spangler was, was very interesting. He said that after the sled test, he had very little contact with the FBI. Um, that he was, you know, um, transferred to Thailand and, and did work in Southeast Asia. Of course, that was the, you know, the ongoing conflict in Vietnam and, you know, uh, you know, uh, Southeast Asia and all of that sort of stuff. So he was involved in that. The one thing that I wanted to talk to him about was, and I forgot, and it's probably a, a dead end, but <clears throat> there's been a lot of talk about Air America and mm. their, um, what is it? What's the name of that city in Thailand? Kirat? Uh, t- uh, t- 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 Takli? T- t- Takili? T- yeah. Something like that, yeah. So I, I, I've often wondered if Spangler was involved or aware, at least, or involved in that. Um, because I know that was mm. ongoing until I think 74, 75. And he was deployed to the Far East in. Well, those would have been civilian pilots, though. Remember? Yeah, yeah, right. But I, as a C-141 and a C-130 pilot, I wonder if yeah. he had any knowledge of that at all. Sure, you know sure. Saying? Just, um, just through the grapevine. Just, sort yeah, of. just or hey, you know, hey, we're doing that. You know, maybe they were flying out of the same airport. I don't know, you know. Um, but it was a question that I intended to ask and I forgot. Um, yeah. So, uh, but yeah, talking talk to Spangler was very, very cool, and and. Um, it, it informed us that a he was the first one to do a drop zone analysis. Mm-hmm. That that drop zone map that he provided has not been released publicly, and um, and so it's surprising that it's not in the files, right? Somewhere, right mm-hmm. now, it does say that he did a drop zone analysis after the sled test, and that it yeah. matched perfectly with Paul Soderlund's drop zone, um, but. Spangler says that he did one within days after the hijacking, and that's right. when he provided that that yellow, the yellow map. I know we, you know, don't know if it's yellow or not, but um, but uh, you know, that's when that map was provided to the FBI, presumably. Now the question mm-hmm. is, we know that Sage put those red ticks on there, those little red crosses or X's on there. Sage was the one that did that radar and that that forensic points. The question now is, who is the person with the black pen or marker, yeah. the marker, marker or whatever, yeah. who played connect the dots with those uh, plot points and who wrote the timestamps on there? Right. That's a lingering mystery. Was that Sage that did that? 
Was it Spangler that did that? Was it the FBI that did that after they received the map? Um, I don't have an answer. Spangler couldn't really recall. Um, so, you know, that's kind of a, that's kind of a mystery in terms of, you know, we seem to have, I, in speaking with Marty Andrade, he calls it the red ink guy and the black ink guy. He says there's two people. You know, yeah. the, red ink, the red ink guy is a an exact detail-oriented, um, you know, attention to detail, type A kind of person. The black ink guy is just, let me just play connect the dots here with a ruler and a marker and scribble down some numbers. And I got the time stamps wrong and I missed a date. So he's certainly not an attention to detail guy. So, um, you know, you wonder who were the people who had their. Well, there's also the there's also the uh, there's also the blue ink, the blue ink guy. Uh, the blue ink guy is, is me. Um, <laughs> there, there's my there's my flight path. Uh, <laughs> the, it was McCoy. Listen, it was not McCoy, is, people. That is the second after the after the accepted flight path. That's the second most accurate one I've seen. <laughs> well said. <laughs> Well said. Yeah. Um, people, people like that. Yeah. yeah so, so, but I, I was going to ask uh, people to, you know, as we'll go, we'll, we'll go another half hour if we can. Uh, Q&A, let's, I mean, does anybody have any questions out there? Uh, John from JJ's Food Reviews says uh, he's wondering if the uh, slight wandering eye of my sketch. Can you sketch get that was stupid in, flight path map off the screen? Please. I am. I'm going <laughs> back to my guy. He says, is the wandering eye intentional? No, this is just me not being able to Photoshop. Yeah. And let me tell you, John, it was worse. me crazy. And it I've was worse. Made, I've made fun of Ryan from the moment I saw, I saw it. Oh, it, it's fixed, too. I, I wish that I could find, uh, I wish that I could find the original, the original version somewhere that, that but I had. Honestly, uh, in your defense, I think that, K, what is it, KK51, I think yeah. also has a weird eye. I think that one's got kind of a wandering eye a little bit or a lazy Does eye. Does he? I, I think so. So uh, in your defense, but um, but yeah, it does look like he's, um, you know, he's got a, a something going on with his eyes there that are a little off-putting. A lazy eye, yeah. It, 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 no, that, that was just uh, me uh, being unable to, uh, you know, to, uh, uh, um, to, to, to draw accurately. And I wish I could find... Uh, my original version of that was was way uh, uh, was it way gave, was way listen, bad. Man, it gave me a chuckle. Well, I'm sure it did. It I, provided, I'd love to it find it. Provided me with a lot of fodder. <laughs> oh, here he is. Okay, here I'm about to uh, upload it for everybody to see. This is embarrassing, but yeah, this was my uh, this was my original uh, sketch here that I drew, and he did have a bad lazy eye. But like I said, I'm not I'm not a graphic artist. I, I'm it's not my day job. Uh, let's see, where is he? Let me, let me see. His, yeah, see, his right eye is pretty bad there. His right eye is, is really wandering there. Uh, uh, uh. I had to, I had to fix him. But hey, it's I like, mean, you know, it's like it's like Debo and Friday. <laughs> it is Debo. <laughs> yeah, who, yeah, who is Cooper looking at here? So I had to change him a little bit. But yeah, so um, let's see. I, I'll get him off the thing. So. There's JJ. Anybody uh, say Q&A? Uh, somebody else had a question earlier. Let's see. Uh, where was it? Uh, it was Robin. Let's see. She says, uh, where did where she go? Where, where, I got to find this. I'm sorry. This is, this is terrible podcast. Terrible. Uh, terrible hey, it's, your, it's your debut episode, buddy. You I know. No place to go but up. That's, that's true. I do. Have no, yeah, exactly. No, nowhere else to go from the, you know, from the gutter. Here. You're going to get better and then you're going to get better guests, you know, so. better guests than you. Yeah, I don't think so. exactly. <laughs> yeah, who, where did, where did she go? My God, that was uh, Robin, Robin posted. Here we go. Now, do you guys think that there is someone out there who knows who DB Cooper is? I'll let you go first. Cause I think I have an answer. Uh, Man, that's a good that's a good question, honestly. Um I would say no. Really? I don't think so. No. I, I think that this guy was a true absolute loner. I think so, that he was a loner and because just because I thought you were a uh wife could have been an accomplice kind of guy. I, I am, but if I had a gun to my head, I don't think this guy was married. 
you know, I, I don't think, I mean, McCoy, I mean, McCoy was married, but and his wife was in on it. And, I, and honestly, if McCoy had survived and got away with it, I don't think she ever would have come forward with it, you know, because mm-hmm. she was an accomplice, for one thing. Um, Heinemann was married, but was kind of estranged in a way. He was gone for years at a time from his wife, and she was blind also, so I don't know how much she really knew. Um, when Nikki says, what about the respect he showed for the stews? Well, I mean, when I was a single guy, I was still respectful of females. I don't think that matters. No. You know, and especially as an older guy. I mean, I think like, yeah. you know, that that generation, you know, <clears throat> I, you know, I, I think they were a little more respectful of women back in the day at that age. <clears throat> well, what is your thought answer, about? Well, the what answer is your answer? question <clears throat> is the only way for three people to keep a secret is if two of them are dead. So um, I think the fact that no one has come forward credibly and said, I know who D.B. Cooper was and it was so and so. Um, I think probably lends to the fact that nobody, nobody knew who D.B. Cooper was. Nobody knew that their uncle, their grandfather, their brother, their husband was D.B. Cooper, um, because I think somebody would have come forward at this point. After 52 years, that's a remarkable secret to keep. Um, so sure, I, sure. Even, yeah, even, I don't if think... even if it's a wife, if it's a, 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 a child, a brother, a cousin, a best friend. I mean, you know, I mean, Marty was undone. Martin McNally was undone by an accomplice who keeps very his, quickly who couldn't keep his mouth shut. So right. the more people you start involving and letting, you know, know what who you were and what happened and all of that, the harder it is to keep that from getting to so and so and so and so and so and so. So the fact that we've never had anybody credibly come forward and identify D.B. Cooper probably indicates that um that he never told a soul and probably took that secret to his grave. Yeah. Or that somebody did know and they died not long after or, yeah. you know, <clears throat> possibly sure. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, I, I agree. I, I don't think so. I don't, I don't think he told anybody cause I don't think he had anybody to tell. Right. Um, honestly. Um, yeah. I, and, yeah. and you know, we, we talked about it, but my, my personal opinion is that he Martin McNally, this whole thing and lost the money, you know, mm-hmm. that he probably survived, pulled the shoot, the money came yeah. detached from him. And then he drifted four miles and landed safely. And at that point, you know, I know Martin's I, Martin's uh, personal thing was like, screw it. I'm going to go and do it again next week. But this yeah. guy may have just been like, what an, you know, complete imbecile I am. I am just I'm going to be lucky to get I'm going to go home. I'm going to enjoy my Thanksgiving dinner and I'm going to forget this ever happened. And I'm never going to tell a soul. So, yeah. you know, at that point, you're so embarrassed and humiliated and, and discouraged, you're, you're probably not telling anybody. Yeah. Because why would you want to brag about that? Uh, Ulysses has a question. He says, uh, how much do you think uh, having jet black hair impacted the Latin appearance? Uh, I don't know. I mean, I've got jet black hair uh, and I don't look Latin. Yeah, I, I mean, my, my wife is Puerto Rican. I have Cuban friends and Cuban relatives, in-laws. And uh, a lot of times the, the hair isn't necessarily jet black. They're, they're can even be reddish, brown, you know, kind of a lighter brown. Um, so dark hair isn't necessarily indicative of Latin. Um, <clears throat> I've, you know, I've often wondered if maybe he used like a brill cream or some yeah. type of, you know, uh, a styling gel, whatever the early you know, back in 71, that would be. Um, I know some witnesses described him as having what marceled hair or hair similar to Richard Nixon. And Mar- you know? Marceled, uh, the, the various descriptions, um, jet black, yeah. uh, greasy, right. uh, marceled. Uh, one person said it looked like a bank teller hair. Yeah. So <laughs> I, I wonder if maybe he was using a brill cream, you know, well, I mean, look, back in the day it, to kind of especially. Style. It's probably rare for anybody to be in their late 40s and not have gray hair. Yeah. Um, and so there's some gray hair. And so the fact is that uh, several of the witnesses say no gray hairs noted. Right. Um, almost as if to say his hair was colored somewhat. Right. Um, but, you know, I mean, again, people color. I mean, you know, that's not to say he was blonde and dyed his hair because i don't think cooper gave a damn about hiding his appearance yeah beyond wearing sunglasses yeah now marty had dark hair right back in the day uh mcnally yeah 
Yeah, McNally for sure um, had, 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 he had and very he black hair. And he certainly wasn't Latin. So, I mean, I guess it's possible that, you know, they, they could see somebody, but a lot of people had dark hair back then. And, yeah, I mean, you know, not I mean, these guys, both of these guys have black hair, it looks like, right. you know, at least right. from the you know, images. And, right. You know, now that guy um, who I'm assuming is an FBI agent, you know, he he looks like he's got some product in his hair. That's oh, like, for sure. You know, that's some type of like pomade or brill cream or some type of stuff. So, I mean, I could see where you could get a jet black slicked back, you know, appearance on that hair. Well, and what's funny about this photograph is somebody pointed out here that in this photograph, uh, let, let me see if I can, uh, if I, can I do think this. I know what you're getting at. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, let, me, let me upload this. This is this is why the YouTube is a lot better than the Facebook Live because you can do stuff like this on the fly. Um, but uh, yeah, somebody pointed out at CooperCon. I don't know who it was. It, it might have been McNally himself. It might have been Mac, literally Mac himself. No, uh, it was it was somebody in the audience. Okay, who did this? Let me see. Let's see. It was somebody in the audience who did this. Yeah, they said that they said that the the, the FBI agent or somebody in the background uh, looks like Cooper. <laughs> um, that's not a, t a little. His face was a little narrower. I could see it. Now let's not start any conspiracy theories here, Ryan. Come on. I'm not. I'm not. No, <laughs> what I thought you were going to point out, and the fact if you go back to the larger photograph. Yeah. What I thought you were going to point out is how 1970s this picture is. Oh yeah, yeah. Because if you if you look closely at the larger picture, what's Marty got in his uh, left hand? There? A cigarette, man. A cigarette. Now, can you cigarette. imagine? Can you imagine somebody doing a perp walk today and smoking a cigarette? <laughs> no, it, it seems totally like. It, it, I mean, yeah, it it, it is very uh, it is very <laughs> very 1970s, man. Yeah, that, that that he's doing that. There, there it is. There's yeah. his cigarette and his handcuffs and his folder. Yeah. Uh, what what a character and what a what a real I don't know I I just think it was a real treat to you know to have him there you know yeah I can't recommend I just go back to that a lot I can't recommend that podcast enough American Skyjacker I mean, oh yeah it's it's just a great story it's well done it's professionally done it, it's just it's really you know it really gets into the the weeds with him and and I I just can't recommend it enough it's American Skyjacker I think and I got no nothing to do with it so i'm not like you know this is no. a plug uh promotional plug i'm just saying it's a great podcast i think you can find it on all your podcasts you know it's on apple podcast spotify and all those so um, yeah, what uh i want to ask you about um his height what would it, what would your lowest limit be on height what, what, I mean, what do you think about cooper's height i'd probably say about 510 would probably yeah. be the low the low end and i'd say probably mm -hmm. you know the high end would be about 61 so, you know, kind of within that range, um, you know, yeah. the problem is that Cooper was sitting down for most of the hijacking. Yeah. Uh, it's much harder to judge someone's height while in a seat. Um, you know, we kind of have an idea of what shoes he was wearing, but we don't know the thickness of the soles. I mean, I look taller in certain shoes than others. Um, so I, I would say 5'10 to 6'1, to but those are really flexible, I guess. I would have a... I guess my thing is I would have a really hard time with somebody who's five nine ever being described as six feet tall. Right. You know what I'm saying? Like right. the fact that they went that high. Right. Right. T t I, you know, I would have to I would have to defer to the people who saw him standing up. Yeah. You know, I mean, you know, and uh, you know, like Bill Mitchell, I don't think ever saw Cooper standing, did he? Nope. So no. you know, I think Bill would be no disrespect to Bill. I just think he'd be uh, you know a poor, uh, um, you know, a judge of his height because he was. Sitting. Yeah. And of course, Bill famously says that he basically, you know, the FBI, when they were trying to get a gauge of how big he, big Cooper was, they asked him, they're like, well, do you think you could have taken him in a fight? You know, if you yeah. could have. Yeah. And Bill's, Bill's like, like, oh, I well, I could have kicked his yanked him out of his seat. Yeah. yeah. But I mean, that's the confidence of youth, perhaps. <laughs> right. You know? And, you know, the other thing, too, that we need to be aware of, and these are the little details that get lost here is as we mentioned before, he was slouching, you know, he was yeah. either, he was either hunched over like this, or he was slouching down. So, you know, that's an even, you know, more, th that hides yeah. his height even more. So, you know, I think Tina, who saw him standing, excuse me, standing up, Flo, who seems to have seen him standing up, 
Alice, who sees, seems to have seen him standing up. Uh, Dennis Lentz, Hal Williams, those are the people who saw him standing up. Um, you know, yeah. I think we would have to defer to them on terms of height. But but I'd go between 5'10 and 6'1. But let me be clear. If someone came forward who was like 5'8", and, you know, they they found a Cooper Bill in his attic next to a parachute, you know what I mean? I'm not going to be like, well, that couldn't be Cooper because he's an, you know, he's an inch outside my, you know. So, yeah. um, but I, I do get your, I do get your larger point that five. Well, he's, we and he's, he's, well, and he's wearing black too. I mean, black is thinning, black mates, especially skinny ties. It's funny. If you look at like, if you Google like skinny ties online, if you just Google it, it, it says like, oh, you know, you, you, uh, a skinny tie will stretch your torso and make you look taller than you are. And, you know, and black is also very sl slimming and trimming. Mm -hmm. And, and so, I mean, we're, we're really we're really splitting hairs because it's it's hard to yeah. distinguish between someone who's five eleven and six one. You know what I mean? I mean that's a that's a small well, look. And, and people team. suck at height too. Look, I mean there was a there was a stewardess in McCoy's hijacking who told the FBI she thought he was five foot five. Mm -hmm. He was five ten. Mm -hmm. And it's yeah. like, where the hell do you get five foot five from? Right. You right. know. Um, Oh, by the way, that, that reminds me to pull, to pull up my, my sketch here of, um, where about the sketches of, uh, where did it go? Of, um, I thought I added him. Uh, yeah, this sketch here of Heinemann here, uh, is pretty good, actually. This is also, I'm guessing, a Roy Rose sketch, uh, cause this would have been made. Roy Rose was headquartered in Washington, D.C., and, uh, Heinemann's hijacking occurred in D.C. Uh, so my assumption is, is that he would have, being the lead sketch artist for the FBI at the time, would have also done this sketch here of Heinemann, uh, which and, is pretty and those are good. Br those are brilliant sketches. I mean, those are, yeah. he, he, that's, I mean, you can hardly tell that the one on the left, especially the eyes, looks like a damn photograph, you know? Yeah, it's pretty good um, there. I mean, they got, I mean, really his hair is a little weird. Um, I always think he looks like Michael Douglas in Falling Down. Yeah. Uh, if, you, if you remember that movie, but uh, that's a, I, I just always like to go to that photo, go to that sketch. That's not bad. You know, yeah. they, they messed up his hair a little bit. But. That picture on the right almost looks like an older John Hamm. The hey, guy from Mad Men. I, I can see. I, yeah, I can see that. Not not bad. <laughs> not bad. Uh, Packer Jack says. Uh, Packer. You guys, Packer says, uh, do you think that Cooper had Benzedrine, Benzedrine for himself, A, B, for the crew if needed, C, both? I would say probably A. I mean, I know that McNally had um, some sort of amphetamines with him. Um, Heineman had, I believe, Benzedrine itself had a fly jack. That's one of fly jacks, 300 Who? points that he likes for Heineman. But that was, Heineman had Benzedrine. Um, I, Billy Hurst, the, hijack, the copycat, had um, some sort of uh, amphetamine. Uh, McCoy, being the good Mormon kid, did not take drugs or smoke or drink, but he, he had candy with planes. him. Yeah, and he had a candy with him, though. Uh, the stewardesses said McCoy was chowing down on, like, candy the whole time in the back. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Are you convinced that he, that Cooper had something with him, or do you think he was yeah. BSing? Because, because, no. there's, because there's nothing in the FBI files about the Benzedrine. The first time no. that appears is Jeffrey Gray's book, Skyjack, if, if I remember correctly, isn't it? No, 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 no. It's a week after. It's it's in it's in a it's a it's a week after in a, in a newspaper article Ratichek, from Ratacek. Yeah, somebody called Ratacek and Rat was just going through stuff of the hijacking, and that's so. I don't think he'd make that up. That's really. That that, that that's so. Why, I mean, why would it, then why not why not add that detail in his statement? Well, probably because for the same reason that, that Tina said, um, you know. Uh, probably for the same reason that, that Tina said, uh, you know, that she, that night of the hijacking, she was kind of frazzled, you know? Yeah, but she didn't even mention it in her second interview. And he no, was the one didn't. that he told her to. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I'm, I'm prone to believe it because it also shows up in Tussaud's book. Yeah. And I, I don't know, I, I, don't, I doubt that Tussaud would have found this rare article because it's a hard article to find. The one where Radishek mentions Benzedrine, that's not like, but Seattle if Tucson is going to, if Tucson is going to, if if it's in Tucson's book, then he was either going to get it from the FBI files, or he was going to get it from someone like Tina or Rat. 
So considering that Rat is on record as saying, stating it to the media, it would make sense to me that he probably got it from Ratacek as well, because Ratacek and Tucson were pretty tight. No, okay. So uh, when Dina says uh, Benzedrine is the decongestant, no, Benzedrine was basically amphetamine. It was Adderall before Adderall. Basically. Yeah, it was. It was. It had a lot of uses. Housewives used it as a diet, as a diet, uh, a diet, Dire, diet, pill, diet yeah. supplement to try to lose weight. Um, it was given to um, uh, Air Force uh, Air Force pilots, bomber pilots in World War II and Korea to keep them awake for long missions. Um, right. The and, guys in uh, Vietnam had them a lot. Yeah, and that's that's why um, Radic, uh, not Radicek, Cooper um, offered it to the crew because he said if the crew is getting tired, I have some Benzedrine that you can have. At least that's the anecdote um, that, that we're aware of. So I, right. I don't know. I, I'm on the fence as far as the Benzedrine. It wouldn't surprise me. I just haven't seen any official documentation of that. Um, yeah. But um, and, and, and to answer the question, because I think the original question was, did he have it for himself, for the crew, or for both? Um, who's to know? He certainly had it for the crew because he offered it to the crew. Huh. Um, but was he taking it himself? Maybe. Um, right. You know, the... T you know, just to kind of go on a tangent here, the tie had evidence of uh, spores on it that were indicative of the type of stuff that was used in uh, drug um, uh, pill bottles mm -hmm. that were used to kind of coat pill bottles. So you wonder if, you know, he was a regular user of Benzedrine, you know, and that's where he got the, the spores on his tie. Who's to say? But um, he definitely mm -hmm. had it for the crew, uh, whether he had it for himself. I don't know. If I'm pulling off that hijacking, the last thing I want to be is intoxicated, either hyped up or drunk. Yeah. Or high or, you know. Well, and also taking a drug that you're not familiar with. So it tells me that he was familiar with Benzedrine. Uh, sure. Otherwise, you know, it, I mean, that wouldn't be your a good time to, to take your first right. drug. You Which, know? you know, perhaps World War II Korea, you know, he's on one of these air crews that yeah. you know, are given these, uh, you know, uh, uppers to keep them awake and he's familiar with their use. And, um, well, you know, a lot of blue collar people too, like, you know, Dave points out and said it's Ed that, you know, truck drivers, rail workers, lots of people. Uh, probably longshoremen, probably. Yep. Yep. You know, people who work weird if I, hours. If I'm, if I'm correct on my timeline and, and feel free to fact check me, but I think in 1969, Benzedrine became a controlled substance. So, probably right, yeah. uh, so by 1971, I do not believe that you could get Benzedrine over the counter anymore. Um, okay. I think you had to have a prescription for it. Um, that would indicate that Cooper was around people who were selling drugs, apparently. Uh, yeah, or he had a prescription for Benzedrine for some type of, uh, you know, I don't know, narcolepsy. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Day, uh, see, uh, somebody says, okay, uh, JJ's food review says, which was the copycat who was very chill? And seemingly intrepid the whole time, like Cooper was. Well, I would so say you kind of came across that recently and discovered yeah, that uh, that there was a copycat that actually was able to keep his calm, cool, and collected, just like Cooper. Well, two really. Um, Melvin Fisher uh, is one of my canonical copycats. He just didn't jump. He had the parachute on, had the money tied to himself, just chickened out. But Melvin Fisher was considered. I mean, he was very calm. Uh, when you read the reports, the stewardesses say he was rational, calm, never raised his voice, never got angry, never got nervous. She, the stewardess says, I'm sure he was nervous, but he didn't express it. Um, so uh, he was very, very calm. And in fact, he was 49 years old, kind of a loser, um, not a terrible analog to Cooper, really, to who Cooper might have been, kind of similar. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, because I always I always confuse him and LaPointe for some reason, and I don't know why. Mm. Fisher was the one that the crew said, oh, he has some knowledge of aviation. He's got some knowledge yeah. of aircraft. He's yep. definitely got, you know, he, he knew about flight plans the, and he knew and, about. Yeah, the communic uh, he said uh, the dual communication system dual in the aircraft. They were convinced that he had aviation experience. And in fact, he did not. Am I correct? In no, saying that? Uh, he, well, he, he had trained briefly to be a pilot in World War II and had flunked out. And became a mechanic on a bomber, I think. So, I mean, aviation adjacent 25 years earlier, but right. You know, I mean, but here's the thing, though. I mean, I've asked McNally. I mean, McNally spent 1,800 hours on an aircraft in the military. I said, would you have known what flaps 
that flaps would create drag and things. He goes, no, yeah, I didn't think about that sort of stuff, man. It's just not right. You know, um, so there's that. So, and, but then there's another one, another copycat named Billy Hurst, who uh, I had thought long, I had a long thought that Cooper was the only hijacker probably in history who kept the passengers unaware of the hijacking. But in fact, I just found this the week of CooperCon that Billy Hurst, those passengers did not know they had been hijacked until they got off the plane, which was just like, whoa, I thought that was just Cooper. You know, because we used to like chalk that up to Cooper's superpowers, right? Um, and that's just not, you know, I mean, not, not the case. Um, Dave says, uh, can we verify the pronunciation of Lenz and Heinemann? Heinemann is the way that I say it. I don't know how else you would say that. Yeah, I think it's Heinemann. Heinemann. It's Heinemann. I've, I've, I don't know how else you would say that. Maybe there's some Yankee way that you say that. but um, I, I pronounce it Heinemann and I pronounce it Lenz. Lenz, yeah, Lenz. Or see, sometimes it can be like Lindsay, but I think it's Lens. I think I, I think, think it's L Y S N E, well, right? Uh, sometimes it's L Y N S E, but I think it's L Y S N E. Yeah, is the L actual. I'm sorry. Yeah, L Y N L Y S N E is the actual list. It's li yeah, li Lizney, Liz maybe Liz. I don't know. Uh, and Dave says, "Will we see the Charlie Farrell 302 that possibly discounts the B sketch?" Uh, sure. Uh, I've actually got that right here. Um, there, right there. Says so for those in the podcast, a key witness, Florence Schaffner, was very adamant in her insistence that the artist's conception was not a good likeness of the hijacker. In an FD 302 dated December 2nd, 71, Schaffner stated that the conception was not, in her opinion, a good likeness of the hijacker. She requested permission to examine the facial identification catalog and immediately picked out photo KK51 in the facial lines section, stating, That is him, except for the ears and hair. And then it goes on. Um, but you can see there where Charlie Farrell thinks that this interview is on December 2nd, 71, when in reality it was from December, or it was from uh, November 25th, uh, 71. So it was actually several days earlier. And uh, I've got that. Uh, where is that? I've actually got that uh, uh, right here, I think. Here's the one. And you can see on the bottom left here, uh, it says on the bottom left, uh, 11 25 71 as the date of the interview and at the top right it says december 2nd 71. now that's the so thing that's always that, that, as someone who's been nose deep in those uh fbi files for years the dates have always confused me why would there be two dates on that can you explain no okay so yeah it's weird so like you've got three dates actually on 302 you've got the interview date which on the far left is your interviewed on date uh, then at the bottom right, you have the dictated on, because if you people who don't know, they did not audio record interviews back then. They would write down a bunch of notes when they interviewed somebody, and then they would uh, then they would uh, transcribe it to a uh, secretary who would type it up. And so that, the date dictated, is when it was typed up. And then the top right date, I believe, would be when it was probably sent or completed or received, maybe not received, but when it was completed, I guess, or I don't know, honestly, probably, probably when it was, I don't know, that, it's weird, I actually don't know what the top right date is, I think maybe when, when it was completed, probably when it was, probably when it was actually finalized, the document was printed out and ready, ready to be sent, perhaps, mm -hmm. but the bottom left is the important date, that's always the important date, is the bottom left, interviewed mm -hmm. on date, mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. for whatever reason, he, I don't know, just thought that that this interview happened on December 2nd. And that is why we have the Cary Grant sketch, in my opinion. Um, I don't, like I said, I, I do not, I'm not discounting it because witnesses did like it. It's more, this is more about me, not so much discounting comp B. It's about probably giving new life into comp A. Um, because I had always thought that Flo hated Bing. And if Flo hates Bing, well, then I don't like Bing either because I like Flo as the primary witness to his facial features because she stared at him because she interacted with him for many minutes before he became the hijacker. She's the only stewardess who interacted with him uh, before he became the hijacker. So her words have a lot of value to me. So when, when, when I thought that she hated Bing, I didn't like Bing either. But now that she likes Bing. I mean, we have her saying likes the drawing very much. You know? Yeah, everybody seemed to like Bing. So 
not to sidetrack it, but that facial identification catalog, you had a, uh, a kick in the pants a couple of days ago. You want to tell Jeez. us about that a little bit? Oh, boy. Yeah, basically, it was a, this is a nightmare, people. Uh, where is my, I'm trying to get my, oh, it's in her brain. Because the reason I want to do this is because if there are people watching who can oh my God. crowdsource it and somebody's like, oh, yeah, I got one of those. So I don't I think what happened. Basically, so the, the the facial identification catalog basically is this thing uh, looks like. Let me upload these pictures here. This is what it looks like. It's just a catalog of faces that that they would use. Um, there it is. There, it's the FBI's facial identification catalog from the '60s and '70s. It was full of pictures that, like this, where you you know the, 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 a witness would would scroll through and pick out one that they liked, right? Um, you know, for example, you know we have like. Alice Hancock, for example, picked this creature that looks like Butthead from Beavis and Butthead. She said, oh, yeah, hijacking's cool. I mean, she picked this guy out by saying that he had Cooper's head shape. So Cooper's head shape looks like Butthead from Beavis and Butthead, according to Alice Hancock. But these are the sketches. You know, this is what sketches were based on. Well, this thing is probably the most elusive item. I swear to God, like, if you Google facial identification catalog, 10 of the top 15 hits are discussions on the drop zone about it. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's how rare it is. And I, I, I have been after this book for a year, and I have been checking religiously eBay every single week for a year, just like almost set on a timer, check eBay, check eBay, check eBay. And freaking the week of CooperCon, somebody put one on there and it sold for 50 bucks the week I was distracted and I was so upset. I gave myself a migraine headache that lasted for hours. Cause I was like, Oh no. Yeah, you, I mean, like, you, this you is... messaged me and said, I think I'm going to cry. <laughs> uh, yeah. I, I, that's probably the closest I've come to crying as a man. <laughs> like I, I was literally like, I was despondent. Like I, I just went and laid on my couch at the house and just laid there. <laughs> catatonic. I mean, it was just, that's, that's uh, why I was like, I was like, Ryan, man, you need to get help, man. Like this, this case shouldn't cause you that much uh, anxiety and stress. <laughs> no, like it literally like, cause I, I, like this is, this is, I, this is my Holy grail because I mean, for example, that book would answer whose, whose eyes are on the Bing sketch. Is that from Gregory or is that from Hal Williams? You know, because we have, have, I have the 302s where Gregory says, I pick selection FD 42 out of the eyes category and then Williams picks his. Um, and I don't know which one they use for Bing, you know, but Bing, uh, Bing, Bing's eyes are screwed up. But yeah, that, I would have loved that for my book. And I, I actually reached out today um, to Brian Rose, actually. I wrote Brian Rose an email. I said, look, um, I, don't, I don't think Roy Rose is in great health. Maybe he's an older guy now. So he doesn't do interviews anymore. But I asked Brian, I said, look, um, I said, Brian, do you remember this book from your childhood? Because that sounds like a, something you'd come across when you're a kid at your grandpa's. And, oh, it's pictures of these old mug shots, these guys, right? You know, and, and he would have had one. He would have owned one at his house. I know he would have. He was this, I mean, because they, they could have called him and he worked on these at his house, surely. So he would have had one. Um, so I, I messaged Brian. I said, look, you know, if you've got one of these or if you know that if your grandpa has one, let me know. I don't want it. I just, could you scan some pieces of it or take some pictures with your phone of certain pages? We, it would really be beneficial. Um, and yeah, I did message the guy who bought it, Dave. I, I messaged him and I said, where did you get this? An estate sale. It's like, great. That's just wonderful. So it was gotten, in a, it was gotten in an estate sale, but yeah, that was the worst. Have you, uh, this was my idea. Have you reached out to Larry Carr at all and asked if he Yeah, he didn't respond. I messaged or... Larry. I mean, you'd I'm going to email all somebody at the, you know, an old friend at the FBI. But well, I'm going to I'm going to I'm also going to email the local FBI office here in Jackson, Mississippi and just say, hey, I mean, do you have one of these? I know I know I'm supposed to go. I'm also, I know I'm supposed to go through FOIA, but I am a lawyer and I'm a former DA. I mean, I and if it's a, if it's I, 60s, if it's a 60s and 70s facial identification. Catalog, yeah, it's not really relevant. It, it's not today. really relevant now. I mean, it's not like it's a, you know, a, a current one that they would use. So. You know, it's probably just yeah. one sticking around in the bottom of somebody's file. And Dave is saying I should I should message the buyer. Well, 
you can't see who the buyer is on who bought an who won an auction. And I've messaged, I actually messaged the guy who sold. I said, would you by willing be chance to send me that guy's send me that guy who bought it? He goes, well, that's not, that's seller confidentiality. But I was like, okay. Because I was like, you know, just please somebody. But I mean, I cannot explain to you how rare you were like, cheer up, Ryan. One, one more will come along. I'm like, no, it won't. <laughs> like, you don't understand. Like, this is so rare that, like, like I said, it's almost like the T sub. If you remember, like, if you Google like titanium antimony alloy in Google, like the third thing that pops up is you on Reddit a few years ago saying, hey, do, we, do any of you guys know about titanium antimony alloys and all these metallurgists are like, what the hell are you talking about? You know, they, they didn't even know. I mean, so it was rare. I mean, that is the thing about it. If it even is, it's possibly titanium calcium at this point, um, maybe, but I don't, I'm not sure about that. Um, but we'll, we'll see, you know, yeah. but it, it's been, you know, anyway, but it, it's, it's going, but uh, anyway, so I will, uh, we've been going two hours now, so I'll go ahead and end this and wrap it up. But uh, uh, do you have parting thoughts? No, you know, CooperCon was great. It's fun. Um, you know, just, like I said, the social aspect of it is great seeing you and everybody else. Um, it, you know, it was, uh, I think, finding Tom Spangler and speaking with him and getting further information it may not be revelatory. It may not be anything that breaks the case wide open, but it adds context. And I think that's always important and good. Um, yeah. And, um, you know, like I said, you can either be an observer of this case and be content simply, you know, comment, commenting on it and, and, you know, listening to what the quote unquote experts have to say, or you can, you know, go and, and, start doing your own research and investigation and dive into the weeds and look for evidence yourself. So, you know, you and I are the type where we want to be in it and look for evidence and try to solve this thing. Some people would rather be observers and just comment on it. And that's fine too. Um, but uh, I, I would like to see uh, some type of effort at CooperCon where there's a more of a focus on that investigatory evidentiary, evidentiary um, vein. Um, so, yeah. you know, more academic, more academic, more of a, like I said, more of a symposium and less of a convention. Um, yeah. You know, if that makes any sense, but um, you know, that's just me. I'm a huge nerd. So, you know, um, yeah, you me know, too. I, I, I like the, the, I like that stuff more than probably, you know, a normal person would. Yeah. And, and, and there's room for both people. Like somebody said, I've heard somebody say recently that like, there are nerds and there's jocks and the nerds figure shit out and the jocks get the stuff done. Mm -hmm. You know, you need both people mm -hmm. in the world. You know, we yeah. need. Yeah. Oh yeah. And I don't mean to denigrate those people who don't want to, you know, go out and call people who are in the case and, you know, yeah. uh, you know, who spend hours on eBay looking for facial identification catalogs. You know, I mean, that's, you know, that's fine. If you don't want to do that, I'm not uh, putting you down. I may never recover, Chris. Like, well, like I said, this was a death. Then you need, then you need, then you need to talk to somebody. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, uh, yeah. Well, yeah. Well, I mean, yes. Uh, Zodiac it, Killer official. Yes. I, we, we have those pages. Believe me, I've got the pages from Worth Point. There are a few pages out there, and that is how we have come across a few of the things. Uh, like, you know, a few of the like the Butthead guy, like the, from Beavis and Butthead. That is one one of those sheets that is online. If you could um, message that to me, I'd love to use that as my new Facebook profile picture. Uh, butthead? <laughs> well, hijacking is cool. <laughs> you know, great. And on that note, folks, uh, thank you for joining. And this was the inaugural edition of uh, DB Cooper Sleuth. I'm trying uh, to do this. And uh, thank you, Nicole. Good to see you. Yeah. Thanks, uh, Ryan, boy. for having me on. I do appreciate it. And uh, good luck moving forward, man. I hope this becomes a, a thing for you. Great. All right. Thank you, folks. Good night. Cheers.